Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Council. May I first remind all of you of some domestic arrangements. Please ensure that microphones are muted when you are not speaking, that your cameras are located in the correct position and that you switch off your cameras when not speaking. So if I could ask you all to switch off your cameras now, please. Could you all switch off your cameras, please? That you do not interrupt other speakers. Please use the raised hands facility if you'd like to speak, but please refrain from using the other emojis in the meeting. Members are reminded not to use the messaging chat function during the meeting unless, it's, unless it is to report a pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest or to notify the chair that you wish to make a proposal. That if you are attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, you may be asked to leave. Additionally, you'll be invited to speak and ask questions by the chair. Please await your turn. If members lose connection to the meeting, please contact the member support officer, Mary Mandy Smith, as soon as possible. As this is a virtual meeting, you will not need to stand to address the chair, but please can you ensure that you address your questions and comments through the chair. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of the meeting will be filmed, except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed by the council to have consented to being filmed. By entering this meeting, you're also consenting to being filmed by the council and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. The council, members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded. So we'll now move to the meeting. We'll move to the agenda and I'm minded to move the motion on notice to before item eight on the agenda. Therefore, the order will now be items one to seven and then item 12 before returning again to item eight on the agenda. So we'll open the meeting now with item one, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. We have no apologies for absence. Thank you. Item two, declaration of interest by councillors. In accordance with delegated authority, the monitoring officer has granted dispensations to all members in respect of the 21-22 budget papers. Do we have any other declarations? Yes, Madam Chairman, it's Councillor Jan Osborne. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Thank May you, I have Madam your Chairman. declaration, please? Yeah, I'd like to declare a non-pecuniary interest in what is, I believe, still item eight on the agenda. It's the general fund budget, as I'm a trustee on the citizens' advice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that Councillor Arthi? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just for clarity, can we just confirm that those of us that are on parish councils who obviously have a precept through the budget, um, that we have a dispensation as well? I'll ask our monitoring officer. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to confirm for members, you do not need to declare membership of a parish council um, as either a local non-pecuniary or a pecuniary interest for the purposes of the budget setting. Um, it's not an interest that you need to declare because it's a, an appointment. Um, it's, not for, it's not kind of affecting you personally, so that's absolutely fine. Councillor Maybury. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I thought for a moment my hand was not um, working um, on on the screen. 
I would like to declare a non-pecuniary interest in um, quite a few items on the agenda because I am a di director of Sudbury and District Citizens Advice. Fine, thank you. That's noted. Are there any other declarations? Thank you. In that case, if there are no other declarations, we'll now move on to item three. BC 2023 to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on 19th January 2021 for accuracy only. Are there any issues with accuracy? Fine. May I have a proposer, please? I praise it, Sean. Is that Councillor Osborne? Yeah, uh, Dawson. No. Oh, Councillor Do Dawson. Yes, Thank I'm, you. I'm prepared to propose that, Madam Chairman. Fine. So if I'll Councillor Dawson seconds and Councillor Adrian Osborne proposes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Great. Thank you very much. I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the electronic vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. If councillors, if you can open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and then selecting attendance and voting, the voting tab will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote. And Councillor Lindsay, we can we will take your vote manually. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Melvesi and Councillor Plum, are you okay to vote or is there or are you experiencing problems? It's just Councillor Melvesi now. And Councillor Lindsay, can I take your vote, please? Uh, yes, four. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So that was 30 votes for and two abstentions. So the vote is carried. Thank you. So the minutes um, have been confirmed and will be signed at the next practicable opportunity. Item four, leaders announcements. I would like to invite Councillor Ward to present his update. Please can you email any questions and points of clarification you may have for him after the meeting as I'm conscious that we have a very long agenda this evening. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so we have got a long agenda, so I'll try and um, be brief on, on this, but I, I do just want to highlight four things, if I may. Uh, firstly, my team, we're now well into a sustained period of significant weekly decreases in infections. The latest data from the Suffolk Corona Watch site shows that here in Baber, the infection rate is now down to 52.2 per 100,000, which is so much better than a few weeks ago. In total, we've had 3,708 confirmed cases and sadly 209 deaths since the pandemic began, began although this latest number is the, uh, the latest data from the ONS and is only up to the 5th of February. The progress that has been made in recent weeks with the delivery of the vaccines amazing. Despite this, though, this progress has catapulted Suffolk up the league tables in terms of delivery of the first doses to the first four cohorts, and we are now one of the best performing parts of the country. Approximately 60,000 vaccinations have now been delivered and capacity is currently standing at 20,400 per week in Suffolk and North East Essex and 17,200 per week in West Suffolk. The latest news about the effectiveness of the two vaccines is also really encouraging. The work clearly isn't done, however, 
And last week I met with Ed Garrett from our CCGs to ensure that we are working as closely as possible with the NHS to support the delivery of the vaccine. Together we will be targeting our resources and getting to the minority that qualify but have not yet received their jab. It is also really good to see a huge increase in testing capability with the new community testing programme. Rapid asymptomatic testing sites are being rolled out across the county. There's now one in Cornard, Nayland opened yesterday, Holbrook will, will open on Thursday and Hadley on Friday. I'm also really pleased that we have been able to extend our council tax hardship scheme to provide further help to the most vulnerable in our district who have been most impacted by COVID. We now know the government's plans for leading us out of this lockdown. There are lots of reasons to be hopeful, but in the meantime, I would like to re reiterate our wider Suffolk messages that Suffolk needs you to follow the guidance, hands, face, space, to get tested regularly if you're unable to work from home and to get your COVID jab when it's your turn. In, in return, Suffolk supports you through Home But Not Alone and our community involvement, the distribution of business grants, self-isolation payments and, and practical support for those most in need. Moving on now to bins. I mentioned the snow earlier and although it has now melted away, I want to to pay tribute to our bin crews who are back out within 48 hours, including working on the past two Saturdays, making collections and clearing the backlog as best they could despite the weather. They have now managed to catch up despite additional staff absences due to several having to go into isolation. As it was half term last week, I also want to highlight the fantastic initiative that we have in place, building on what we did during the, um, the Christmas holidays to tackle holiday hunger. This scheme involves food, ingredients for five meals for a family of four distributed to families during half term. The initiative delivered on behalf of the council by Abbeycroft Leisure's Explore Outdoor team ensures that no child goes hungry when free school meals are passed, uh, paused during the school holidays. Families in need are identified by local schools and the food parcels also include ideas on how to make food stretch further in future, making a real difference to the lives of low income families in our district. Finally, many of you will have heard that the sale of Chiltern Woods to Taylor Wimpy has been completed. We can now look forward to this new community grow over the coming years and Baber will ensure that we're involved in delivering the sustainable transport infrastructure needed to integrate it into the greater Sudbury area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ward. We'll now move on to item five, to receive notification of petitions in accordance with council procedure rules. Thank you, Chair. Please be advised that we have received the following validated petitions. 364 valid signatures urging the Council to reconsider and continue to fund the customer access point. And number two, 34 valid signatures urging the Council to reconsider and continue to fund the customer access point in its current location for at least two years. Both petitions have been dealt with through the petitions process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Item six questions by the public in accordance in accordance with council procedure rules none received chair thank you item seven questions by councillors in accordance with council procedure rules none received chair as mentioned earlier we're now going to move on to item 12 which is the motion on notice just to, cons to consider the motion received from Councillor Creswell. Thank you, As Chair. we have a long agenda this evening, I'll be limiting the debate on this motion to 30 minutes. Councillor Creswell, would you like to move the motion? Thank you, Chair. I'll read my motion. Dear members, Councillor Alison Owen and myself bring this motion that the Council does not have faith in the leadership of John Ward and ask that he resigns with immediate effect. Alice and myself were elected in May 2019 as a couple of political novices. As we met Councillor Ward, spoke over a coffee, and were more than happy for him to show he was the right person to lead the council forward. I'm now going to try to explain why we feel this decision needs making. Councillor Ward is the leader of the cabinet, has played a leading role in the decision at Sudbury and the surrounding parishes without proper consultation of the people who elected us all as councillors. His part in the decision making has led to protests, marches, petition, heat debate in the papers and in the town council meetings. The first deci decision we felt councillor Wood got wrong after the, our election 
was to try and change the name from Baber to South Suffolk. This went to full council and it was rejected by many fellow Tories. It was the first time I'd seen Councillor Ward try and push things through without doing his due diligence. We all know we were told it would cost nothing, but we all know that wasn't the truth. There was logos on all the council vehicles, plus all the paperwork and everything else that goes with it, and the list goes on. The next thing was Councillor Ward's baby, the hotel at Bellevue Park, and he was definitely not listened to Sudbury residents or anyone whose views were different regards the hotel and the park. We were repeatedly told that the residents of Sudbury wanted the hotel in that area, and we even had officers come down from Baber to the Mayor's Parlour in Sudbury telling us the same, showing us slides. A few months later, the hotel fell through and the paper issued a pie chart. It showed that 75% of the town did not want the hotel in that position. It was overseen. We'll now go on to the access and the advice centre, moving to the library. The town council were not informed where it was going, although I knew a month before it was announced. The staff of 2.8 people being told they may be made redundant just before Christmas. Lovely. The town clerk repeatedly asking for information and getting nothing. The way the leader and to a certain degree cabinet ministers dealt with this was appalling. The town council felt like we were being lied to. As the, the Baber was saying, the town council were asking for more money, which was not the truth. Baber were putting less money in year after year from year two. After spending £60,000 to set up at the town hall and running a Monday to Friday service for the old, vulnerable, we have been told that the service is going to, from the 1st of April, is going to run on a Monday and a Thursday, two days a week, with the odd day put in if required to save £30,000, but cut the service by 60% at a time when we have the most difficult period since World War II and are heading for mass unemployment. And the people with the least skills who need help, a face-to-face -face meeting with a person they can relate to. What good is an iPad or a laptop to a person who has no idea how to use them or, in, or no internet at home to connect to? Councillor Parker said at the meeting, reference, his own business was going towards online sales. I agree entirely, but this is not a car insurance, a holiday house insurance. This is insulting. This is people's lives. It's their universal credits, their council tax, and things that are very, very important to them. This will cause stress and more mental health problems. Now, the ladies are going to do the same amount of hours, I've been told, as they were going, they were doing at the town hall. But three days might not be in Sudbury. Three days may be at Stone Market. How does that fit into the carbon footprint, uh, Councillor Melvasey? and council award you go on about going green and there we are we're going to send people perhaps to stone market three days a week and if they live in different areas they've got to take their own cars now we'll go on to the car parking the car parking free car parking for three hours in Sudbury and Hadley this had nothing to do with going green but a short-term financial fix Thomas Morelli put in a petition which wasn't accepted because it was on postcodes, but it gauged the, the feeling of the town. 1,600 plus signatures in a very short space of time. And some people didn't want to give full addresses because they didn't really want to give full addresses to people they didn't know. So... Councillor so, Purcell, you have 30 seconds. OK, Sudbury's got an 8% vacancy rate. The national average is 14. Is this because we have free parking? 84% of the car parks is paid by business rates. So I have brought up four areas which Major Ward is massively involved, but he's not listening to people, not listening to residents. I didn't like being called a coward in the paper, which I'm not. A lot of councillors get four years like I get at the council. Time is up now, Councillor Creswell. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Owen, you're muted. Sorry, I got one thing right, didn't I? Thank you. I'd like to second that. Um, can I leave it to the end for my bit? Yes, you can. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We'll now move to debate. 
councillors will only be allowed to speak once and for three minutes and this will be timed. So would you, would anyone like to start the debate? Councillor Lindsay. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm uh, going to vote for this motion. Um, uh, and I, but I don't, um, I do so slightly reluctantly because I, I don't like making things personal and um, I have some respect for, for John Ward, uh, Councillor Ward. Um, but I do think um, that the problem he has is the system he's uh, agreed to set up, the cabinet system, um, which isn't working to include um, all councillors' views and particularly not. Um, councillors from all parties. Um, he made a decision at the start of this um, term to exclude the Green Party from the Cabinet and to exclude Labour from the Cabinet. Um, there were 23% of people in Labour, of voters, voted Green. And I just think it's completely unfair and undemocratic to decide to exclude that voice from the decision-making body of the council. Um, if we've got to have a, a cabinet system, we should at least include a proper political balance in that cabinet. And I believe the cabinet even now doesn't reflect political balance across the council. And there's only one person you can blame for that, and that's Council Ward. Um, so I should be supporting this motion. And I look in future to move to a committee system which is what Baby used to run, which allowed all councillors who are all elected, after all, by equal amounts of the electorate to have their say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lindsay. Councillor Beer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> I'll keep my remarks more to the parking side. Well, members, this is a bit rich, this motion coming from councillors Creswell and Owen. Read the question that this council has no faith in the present leadership, whatever that may mean. May I remind you that two weeks ago at the cabinet meeting, there was an opportunity for members to challenge and put questions about these issues, in particular Parkham in Sudbury and Hadley. Madam Chairman, you and your two Hadley colleagues, Councillor Dawson and Councillor Fraser, supported each other and all three of you argued your concerns against the parking charges in Hadley. <clears throat> I was very impressed. Meanwhile, I alone argued against the parking in Sudbury and was not supported by any Sudbury member. Councillors Creswell and Owen did not even bother to attend the meeting or to take part, to join in, or even give me some support in trying to make a case. I battled on alone. Where were you, Councillor Creswell and Owen? I asked you, where were you? You did not speak up, up against the, um, and argued against the charge in the Sudbury. You did not support my case. You remained silent, very silent, but now you're jumping on the bandwagon for political gains. I believe that the people of Sudbury and Great Cornard were let down badly by you and your colleagues. And now the motion of no faith against the leader should be rejected. And that I now say, and I would suggest that we have no faith in you as Sudbury councillors, Creswell and Owen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beer. Councillor Ayres. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I actually do support this motion because um, I am elected as a councillor and I'm here to contribute to good governance and to encourage community participation and citizen involvement in decision making, which is under our constitution, part one, 2.3, um, dotty two, three and four. Um, I'm here to effectively represent the interests of my ward and of individual constituents, which is what I've been trying to do. 
and to respond to their inquiries and their representations fairly and impartially. I have had so many people, because my name and address is still outside the town hall, some people have taken theirs off, and um, I have so many people say to me, what on earth is John Moore doing? It's very sad. And I have been inundated with letters, replying to Peter Beer. I was there at that meeting, but having sent emails and whatever, I've been totally ignored. The other thing is looking through the little book that we were given when we were elected profile, and it says the main purpose of the role of the leader is to promote the work of the council and to champion public service needs on behalf of local residents, businesses and visitors. He has not done this. I had an email last night saying the library was only visited by an officer last Friday. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ayres. Councillor John Osborne. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, if I was given longer, I, I'd speak. I would challenge um, some of the comments that Councillor Creswell has made. However, given the time I have got, I will say that Councillor Ward is a man with integrity, commitment and knowledge. For those councillors who were councillors before the 2019 elections, you will remember that Councillor Ward went out to our town and parishes on a Saturday morning to reach out and engage. This approach has never ever been done before. And unfortunately, COVID prevented him from doing the same um, after the 2019 elections. He works many, many hours for the good of Baber and its people. You may not always agree with him, but that does not make him a bad leader. I have every faith in Council Award and I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Uh, Councillor McFraser. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I won't be supporting this uh, motion. Um, Councillor Fraser, um, we've got a problem with your headphone. If I think you need to bring your microphone bit. That's it. Thank you. Well, yeah, I've got two out of three, right? So I'll thank you um, for that, <laughs> Madam Chairman. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, my apologies to everyone. Could you start again? Sure, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, I won't be supporting this motion uh, neither. Uh, at the last Baber meeting, uh, I spoke uh, predominantly about Hadley and Councillor Creswell picked me up and commented on that particular issue with parking, saying we were all in this together. And as Councillor Beers quite rightly pointed out at the Cabinet meeting on the 4th of February, uh, I and uh, the other Hadley members and Peter and Councillor Beer all spoke at that cabinet meeting uh, with regards to all these issues. And as Councillor Beer quite rightly pointed out, the other Sudbury members were absent. I don't understand this motion, a motion asking for a resignation. Surely the strength of a motion would be a vote of no confidence with a prospective replacement leader in place. And there's no evidence of that. And if we're going to talk about chronological events when we were elected in 2019, I recall there being an issue of we, the Conservative group, not having an overall majority and Councillor Ward making that determined leadership move to actually involve other parties and independents to actually form um, a cabinet and an administration to move this council forward. I reiterate, I won't be supporting it for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fraser. Councillor Malvisi. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, this is more a point of information. Uh, the cabinet system is working and working very well. But members need to take on board that they can attend cabinet briefings. They can attend and put questions to Cabinet. It's very sad that in my time as a district councillor, no member has attended to do this. The opposite, the opposite side, if we call them that, um, Mid Suffolk, they are well, the members are well represented and do challenge the thinking. So, members, you have to take the responsibility that you can attend. You can question us, you can challenge our thinking, but you have singularly failed to so do because not one has turned up. 
management by committee is universally recognised as the most inefficient and ineffective method of management. I will be su not supporting this um, motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Malfizi. Councillor Maybury. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I would like to point out to Councillor Malvisi that I have attended a cabinet meeting um, and I have spoken. Um, I will be supporting this motion and I'm afraid uh, Councillor Ayres sort of um, took my thunder from the Constitution under Article 2, um, if members would like to look at it, which is the roles and, and functions of all councillors. There are several items there that I believe Councillor Ward is not doing at the moment. I am not going to break any confidentiality, but I can certainly quote from one of my residents who actually said to me when they had a problem with a refuse collection that they asked Councillor Ward about it and his reply was, well, my my dustbins are emptied. I can't see why you've got a problem. Now, I don't call that very good leadership. I am actually very pleased to say that I sorted this residence issue out quite fairly and within 24 hours. And I'm just wondering why Councillor Ward could not have done that too, considering he's probably in a better place to actually um, speak to officers. There are quite a few instances where residents have spoken to me at length about Councillor Ward's leadership. Some I think can, um, I would never ever repeat. Um, I'm too much um, of a gentle woman, but I must say it has all been negative. I have not had one person who actually thinks that Council Ward is doing a good job in leadership at the moment. Um, so I will definitely be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maybury. Councillor McCraw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm approaching this from a slightly different angle, uh, that of overview and not scrutiny. Uh, sometimes I feel like piggy in the middle between Council and uh, cabinet and I do attend cabinet actually every time Councillor Malvisi slightly missed the fact that I too am a member I'm not a member of cabinet uh, and I'm a councillor. It's been an incredibly difficult year possibly the worst that Baber has ever faced and I think I'd like to argue for a sense of perspective here. Uh, we have before us tonight a balanced budget now, uh, during 2020, that possibility seemed quite frequently remote. And we know we've got balanced uh, budget pressures coming up in the next three years. Despite all of this and a horrible year with the COVID-19 pandemic, the essential work has continued, and that's the job of the Council. The Council have received a lot of praise during that year for the work done by members and officers in handling the pandemic, grant distribution, and a variety of other things. Now, the three issues being mentioned uh, in the supporting argument by Councillor Creswell are, have all been addressed, and they're all rather disconnected issues. They're not the work of a single person. They're the work of a variety of different uh, decision-making processes. Again, I've had the opportunity to look at these. I think perhaps there's a disconnect. I think that's fairly clear. And I'd like to comment on why I think there's a disconnect, because perhaps due to the pandemic, the remote meetings, we've lost that personal contact we used to have with each other uh, on a human level, uh, where we'd bump into each other, chat things over and be able to have those sorts of informal conversations that make life work, because that's how life works. So I think we have lost a sense of perspective. These uh, issues have been conflated in a way that I don't think anybody has enjoyed. Um, I've looked at the decision making process involved and, and, and I'm more than satisfied that proper processes have been followed and I've always worked hard to ensure that they are according to the Constitution. The point about this motion is it assigns blame. And I don't believe blame is appropriate here for one individual, the leader 
or indeed any other individual. There are a variety of people all working separately, but together towards a constant aim, and that's to make the council work better. Make it work, make it work better. Not everybody is going to agree with every decision, but for those reasons, I cannot support this motion, and I would urge other members not to support it for the same reason. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCraw. Councillor Davis. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I concur with um, so, w w what some of my fellow councillors have said, <clears throat> and, and, and I'll go slightly different as well. When we're on the cabinet, which is something I didn't vote for um, all those years ago, um, but having, having said that, I've been part of the cabinet for two administrations now, and uh, I have to say, I think this administration is um, a far more cohesive and productive cabinet. We've had to make some very tough decisions. And I say the word we, because John is the leader and he's the one that gets the brickbats, but we're in this together and we've made the decisions for the benefit and for the, the best of all of all residents in, in Baber. It's not a popularity contest. Yes, people are um, manoeuvring towards elections. And yes, some people have got their own personal ax to grind, but basically, we're, we are here for the best of the uh, the residents. And John Ward, I have to say, and I would be the first as an independent to speak out if I didn't think he was doing a good job, A, as a councillor, B, as a cabinet member, because don't forget, he's got his own portfolio, which he's, uh, I think, produced absolute miracles with his team in getting this budget through as well, getting to this budget together, but also as a leader. And I know about leadership. I've, I've um, been part of many good teams and I've seen good leaders and I've seen bad leaders and I'll say unequivocally John Ward is a good leader he's an excellent leader of uh, Baber District Council and quite frankly I don't think there's anyone else that that is willing or able to do the job at the moment so I will most definitely not be voting for this motion thank you thank you Councillor Davis Councillor Horan Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I won't be supporting this because I think, quite honestly, it rather smacks of um, political opportunities, opportunism. Um, so I, I, there we go, that's better. Um, but I do think in some ways we do have a bit of a problem. We, we seem to present things very badly, um, which I know is down to the comms team. And sometimes we just don't seem to think ahead, which does concern me. Just recently in the press, um, Baber councillors have um, been quite slanted and there's a reason for that. I know that Alistair spoke of disconnect and yes, maybe that is part of it. I think we've lost a bit of teamwork. And in a long email exchange with John, who's a neighbouring councillor of mine and I do have respect for, and I think um, he does a pretty good job. But in an email exchange, he said the problem, well, I was trying to get him to listen to my point of view. He said the problem was that people didn't listen. Now, for somebody to say that others aren't listening um, may mean that he's not listening himself. So I think maybe there is a problem there in a private conversation. Maybe I can give John a few um, words of advice. I think he's basically a good leader, but he does suffer a bit from what I call Ipswich Townitis. Um, recent managers, the more wrong they go, the more they try and defend the impossible. And I think John just does need to have a little bit of advice and um, just present himself a little bit better and the thoughts of the council as well. I may abstain or if other people say good things about John, I may just about support him, but it's a bit on a knife edge. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Horan. Councillor Hardacre. Hello, I um, wanted to say that I will be supporting this motion. Um, I've, I'm a new councillor from the 2019 intake and it has been a, con a constant stream of car crash, um, newspaper headlines, retractions, walkbacks, U-turns since then. And most of the time they have, um, unfortunately, John Ward's name on them. Um, I'd like to correct some uh, offer opinions on some of the things that have been said recently in this debate. Um, it has been mentioned um, that the pandemic has played a part 
in this, but that's not true. The Bayburg name change was pre-pandemic. Most of the hotel development was pre-pandemic. Um, and John's also been praised during this debate for his working together to bring the council together um, for this cabinet system to make it representative. But the Green Party got nearly one quarter of the vote and have won eight for the councillors and have no seats on cabinet. So it's clearly uh, an attempt to consolidate power in a party which does not have a majority. And that's how most of the deals and things were put together from my point of view. Um, as for cabinet and um, other councillors being invited to cabinet, so I see two solutions to this. One is that maybe all councillors just go to every council meeting and just they can just become 32 member council cabinet meetings. If that's the case, if we if that's the only way we can be involved in decision making, secondarily, um, if these decisions are going through cabinet and cabinet's approving them and these U-turns are happening, then maybe the entire cabinet is unsuitable. We need to look again, like John um, that Robert said, at the cabinet, or if, if not the model itself for the council, the cabinet's makeup. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardacre. Was there anyone else who wished to speak? Councillor Ward. Yeah, uh, I suppose I ought to say a few words, uh, if, if that's all right. Um, uh, thanks, Councillor Hurran, comparing me to Ipswich managers. Hopefully not the recent ones. I'd, I'd, uh, Bobby Robinson was very successful, but um, that's... Um, another matter just a, um, a couple of things um councillor mabry's uh um, not so sure that um any of that is uh, particularly accurate so uh, normally uh, when people contact me about refuse collection i get onto it very quickly and uh lots of emails between me and uh, the relevant corporate manager confirming this so uh, um i, I just question the nature of Councillor Mabry's stories there. Um, but um, the accusations that we don't consult or engage are simply not borne out by the facts. On two of the three issues in Sudbury, Bellevue and parking, we have consulted mm. and listened to opinion and we have compromised a fact that is not accepted by those behind this motion. Councillor Cresswell says that the Bellevue Hotel is my baby, but proposals for this go back long before I was elected to this council in 2015. Over the years, have been, uh, there has been extensive consultation on various plans as they've come forward, including, since I became leader, two public exhibitions, a public meeting, as well as various space. On parking, we listened to the correspondence we received. We listened to last month's petition debate, and we listened to the overview and scrutiny committee. The result was that we amended the paper to reach a compromise, and many accept that this compromise is reasonable. There you go, that word compromise, that's the essence of politics. But having said all this, I and the Cabinet do recognise that there needs to be a way of involving Council more in the more contentious executive decisions, and so we will need to explore options for this. Now, to address my leadership style, as there's clearly an intent to personalise the things that Cabinet and the Council do. I know that there are lurid claims about my role in decision making being made online by a sizable group who have used this as a justification for extreme personal abuse, which has been going on for nearly two years now. I've had a death threat dealt with by the police, threats of violence, and only today I was advised that there is a photo of me with a target on my head on Facebook. How sick can people get? This is disgusting behaviour and it is deplorable that elected members of this council would seek to offer its support. I'm not an elected executive mayor and I do not have the authority of such an office. We operate a cabinet governance model here and executive decisions are made by the cabinet. And it is not a supine cabinet. I made sure that it is made up of strong individuals from three groups on this council. Individuals who are not Have shy. Have 30 and seconds. Take one example, Councillor Bosby. You all know Dave and the notion that he could be told what to do by anyone is fanciful. No, this motion is not about consultation or engagement or listening, which we make every effort to do, or indeed me. It seems to be nothing more than uh, Sudbury Town Council through its proxies here telling, trying to tell this council what to do. We're the district council and we must make decisions for the benefit of all of our residents. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ward. I'll go to Councillor Arthur and then Councillor Owen, and then that will be all. Councillor you, Arthur. Um, yeah, my first thought is that I'm sure this is really uncomfortable for Councillor Ward. Um, I hope that wasn't the sole intention of the motion, um, and I do feel for him. Um, I'm always happy to listen to Councillor Cresswell, um, but I, I don't agree with him here, and I'm happy to offer John Ward my wholehearted support. 
to use the words from the motion, in fact, I do have faith in John Ward's leadership. 20 months ago, we, we had a huge task on our hands to put together a workable administration under the cabinet model um, with which we currently have to work. That could be changed, but currently we have to work within, within that. And that's the position we were in 20 months ago. John took on the role of leader and appointed a mixed cabinet drawing on councillors from across the political groups. The last 20 months, and others have said this too, I think Councillor McCraw, the last 20 months have presented huge challenges and John has risen to those challenges with real commitment. His matter of fact style might not suit everyone, but we don't offer him a challenge, we should offer him thanks. So my thanks go to John for what he's done over the last 20 months, and I have every confidence in him being able to continue to the end of the term. Thank you, Councillor Arthi. Um, and I'm sorry, Councillor Busby, um, we have reached the 30 minutes that I've set aside for this time. So um, I'm afraid there won't be time for you to speak. So I'll new move now to Councillor Owen, who reserved her right to speak earlier. So Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just say this is not political at all, one little bit. Right. Councillor Ward has not been open and transparent to the counts councillors on the back benches. I feel that he has let Sudbury, Hadley and the surrounding villages down. If we do not have the information before the events, we do not have the ability to represent the public. Sudbury has been hit with two major disruptions this year alone. The advice centre, which is reducing the hours and that affects all villages around us as well as Sudbury. Car parking, the town mayors asked for reconsiderations until the parking reveal was done. That was rejected. And who knows what will bring for Bellevue House and our old pool site. Let us hope we are listened to on that. We were told that the cabinet was democratic, but with eight seats and no Greens, which they have four councillors, where is the democracy there? We are Babel's biggest town and surely in our own right we should be listened to. I urge the councillors who feel that they need a change to vote with us on this motion. And this is not personal. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Creswell, have you got anything you'd like to add? Sorry. No, I, I sorry, I am. Um... I agree with Alison. I, I have personally have got no problems with um, Councillor Ward. Um, I just feel that some of the things that have been done haven't been right. And um, that's why we decided with the motion, we could have sat there and done nothing. But I have so many people come up to me in the street who are absolutely cheesed. That's the only way you can put it in lay, cheesed off with the present situation, what is going on in our town. I'm afraid I'm the same as Alison, Suez, and all the Sudbury town councillors who are well known in the town and even walking the dog, there'll be somebody come up with me saying, can't you do anything about it? So we've gone around it the way we thought was best. And uh, Mr Ward has got good points, but Mr Ward's biggest point would be to listen and listen to the people. And as for saying... They did a survey on the car parking. A day or a week in February is not the way you do a survey. You do it over a sustained period of time, summer months included, to find out what people's habits are, because they're very different in the summer to the winter. Thank you for listening, and um, I hope people vote with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Creswell. So we're going to move to the electronic vote now. Please remember everyone, when you do vote, uh, if you're voting for Councillor Ward to remain leader, you have to vote against the motion. So, um, and I think um, our corporate manager governance is going to explain that as well. So I'd like to now ask the corporate manager governance and civic office to conduct the electronic vote. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, can you open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting? The vote for this agenda item will show in blue, but you may need to tab down to the bottom to find the blue line. 
And just for clarity, you will need to vote for in support of the motion, asking Councillor Ward to resign or against if you don't want to support the motion. Thank you. Councillors Beer and Hinton, we're still waiting for you to vote. Um, are you experiencing any technical issues? Uh, oh, yes, it's gone all together now. Hang on, okay. I'll try again. Uh, where are we? Let's go into it. Ah, uh, it's getting this bar to move down. It's not easy. Right, let's see if I can... I can't get it to move down. Councillor, I'll take your vote manually, if you like. Um, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm voting uh, against the motion. Against the motion. Thank you. Why wouldn't that work? Try that again. Thank you. Um, the voting is now complete. Um, oh. We have 10 votes for the motion. 20 against the motion and two abstentions. Thank you. So that that motion is lost. We'll now move back to the agenda. Item 8, BC 2024, general fund budget for 2021 and 22 and four year outlook. I would like to invite Councillor Ward to introduce paper BC 2024 and to move the recommendations in the report. As this is a complex paper, I'm minded to allow Councillor Ward and Councillor Jameson, who is tabling the amendment, and their seconders longer than the normal time allowed in these circumstances. All other councillors will have three minutes. So thank you, Councillor Ward, um, if you'd like to present your paper. Yes, I would. Thanks, Chair. At last, we've got the nonsense out of the way. We can get <laughs> on with the serious business, what our residents elected us to do, not play childish games. But before I start, I'd first like to give my heartfelt thanks to the finance team. Every year they work extremely hard over autumn and winter on the budget for not just one, but two councils. And they've had to discuss and agree their contents with two cabinets. But this year they've also had to deal with the requirements of COVID-19 preparing regular reports of the impact on our finances to the MHCLG, assessing how the government's support has helped, and also ensuring the government's business grants are available for us to distribute promptly. <coughs> the Section 151 officer has built an excellent team, and we should all be very grateful for that. So now to introduce the report. I'm pleased to introduce report BC 2024 for the 2021 to 22 general fund budget and four year outlook. This year, we are in an entirely unforeseen, new and difficult situation. The world is a very different place from where it was when I presented last year's budget. Indeed, the fact that we are doing this online rather than in the council chamber is a very visible reminder of this. It is no exaggeration to say that we have had to prepare this budget under the most challenging of circumstances. The impact of COVID-19 has hit us on top of having to respond to, to the continuing fall in government funding for local authorities. The financial impact of COVID this year has been constantly evolving and our initial very worrying assessment has been ameliorated by very generous government support. Although the latest forecast is that it will fall short of our increased costs and loss of income by £400,000. And the government hasn't only been generous to local authorities, there have been substantial grants for businesses and residents in need. There is again uncertainty this year over the core funding that will be available over the medium term. The three year comprehensive spending review has been delayed again and a one year review was published in November, focusing on continuing the response to COVID. 
This does seem a sensible decision by government, given the current circumstances, and a longer term review can wait until we are in recovery. The financial support for COVID pressures will continue into the first quarter of next year, as will the Rural Services Delivery Grant. Additional support for businesses in the current lockdown is also being provided. The government has confirmed that the fair funding review, business rates review and business rates reset have been deferred yet again. I'd like to draw your attention to the announcement of the £4 billion levelling up fund for infrastructure to support recovery. This supersedes the local pinch point fund and so the Suffolk County Council expression of interest for Sudbury will be rolled over to the new fund. The financial settlement for 2021 to 22 does give us additional funding of £724,000, which £199,000 has been built into the budget and the rest either transferred to earmarked reserves or used to cover business rates and council tax losses. There is a new local council tax support grant of £115,000, a new lower tier services grant of £91,000 to compensate for a reduction in the final year new homes bonus payments and ensure that core spending power isn't reduced. £414,000 of the fifth tranche COVID funding and an extra £11,000 rural service delivery grant to increase this to £238,000 have also been provided. We've also benefited by £111,000 of compensation for under-indexing the business rates multiplier, which is included in the Section 31 grant. This has all now been incorporated in the funding for this budget, with the exception of the COVID fund. Of until we have assessed any additional financial impact in 2021 to 22. £76,000 of the 115000 local council tax support grant has been included and will be transferred to the collection fund reserve, while the remaining £39,000 will be distributed to town and parish councils, and the parish allocations are provided in Appendix C. In addition to the, to the financial settlement, the budget requires £692,000 or 83% of the anticipated 2021 to 22 new homes bonus receipts. There will only be one small new homes bonus payment next year and nothing after that. As ever, there is a complicated picture regarding business rates. We are forecasting an additional £215,000 in business rates funding and the budget also requires all of the Section, section 31 business rates grant of £1.5 million which is a net overall reduction of £91,000 compared with the current year's budget once all the elements have been taken into account. Changes to the business rates levy and pooling benefit will result in a further net reduction of £59,000 in funding. The forecast business rates deficit of £658,000 for, for the current year can now be spread over the next three years, which is good. We will again, and I know none of us likes this, be increasing council tax at the maximum level allowed without requiring a referendum which is £5 per year or 2.96% for a band D property. The annual council tax for a band D property will now be £173.86. As a result of increasing numbers of people claiming the local council tax reduction scheme and a lower, a lower collection rate, we have based the budget on a 0.3% reduction in the tax base. Incidentally, this is not the 2.2% as stated on page 66 of, of your report, which is an error. But this may increase if the numbers claiming support increases. And the net effect is that we are forecasting a total council tax increase of £39,000 this year, but this is helped by the local council tax support grant. The budget setting process has again seen line by line budget challenges to, to identify savings, but the cabinet has also had to make some difficult decisions. In addition to the council tax increase, which for me is the most difficult, we have also approved a revision to our parking tariffs. We have increased the garden waste collection fee. We have increased, uh, we have removed the locality budgets and free under 17 swims for this year. And we have um, implemented a general 3% increase for our fees and charges. Our new Sudbury customer access point will also provide considerable savings. Although I must reiterate that its primary purpose is to deliver a better service. On the plus side, we are continuing our support for the Sudbury and Ipswich CABs at the same level. We are able to finance the transfer to hydro-treated vegetable oils for our vehicle fleet for the next year offset by travel cost reductions. We are forecasting ICT cost savings of £128,000. Overall, we are forecasting a surplus of £143,000 the unused portion of new homes bonus receipts. Although we are currently predicting surpluses for the, uh, the current year, but there's still a lot of uncertainty regarding this and for the 2021-22 year, 
These shifts in the context of our interim outlook, which I will address in a moment. We will use £335,000 from earmark reserves for specific service expenditure, but this will be offset by some transfers in, most, not most notably the £143,000 budget surplus from the new homes bonus receipts into the new climate change and biodiversity reserve and the £414,000 into the COVID reserve. This means that we are able to increase our reserves in uh, the forthcoming year, although the transformation fund will be slightly lower. It is essential that we maintain reserves at this level so that we can respond to unexpected events without impacting services. At this point, I would like to mention that we are forecasting a total of £1.8 million net income from our CIFCO investments, an increase of £745,000 on the current year. Totally storm and is providing much needed liable income. On top of this, we are forecasting £39,000 income from our pool. That a risk has been highlighted regarding the relatively low level of expenditure covered by our fees and charges income. Ours is the lowest percentage of comparable authorities. We will need to look more closely at this in future and ensure, particularly, that our discretionary services take on more of the financial burden. I thought you'd like to know that compared to the last year, as percentages of our total income, council tax, business rates and government grants have all fallen, while fees and charges and our investments have increased. This trend will, indeed will have to, continue in the years to come. We also need to project a medium-term four-year outlook, which is both sensible and sustainable. Funding assumptions for the next four years are shown in paragraphs 8 to 11 to 8 to 14, with a four-year forecast included in Table 6. The overall budget gap for the three years from 2022 to 23 amounts to, amounts to a cumulative deficit of £1.7 million. Further significant income or savings or both will be needed to address this. Unfortunately, we can no longer rely on income from the Bellevue Hotel project. For the past five years, we have used 81% of new homes bonus receipts, a total of £3.78 million to balance the budget, and this will no longer be available to us. The capital programme is set out in Appendix A and the planned spend for 2021 to 22 is £6.2 million. The financing for this is shown in the second table in the appendix. The major differences from this time last year are that we will have completed our CIFCO investments by the end of the current financial year and the Bellevue capital investment is no longer required now that the hotel project will not take place. I just want to say a few words about Appendix E, which sets out the flexible use of capital receipts strategy. Hitherto, it's been the rule that capital receipts can only be used to support capital expenditure. However, recent guidance from the government will now allow some flexibility and enable capital receipts in the period up to 31st of March 2022 to be used to fund revenue spending if that spending will generate ongoing savings to our net service expenditure. This could be either through achieving either reduced service delivery costs or reduced demand for services. Section 2 lists some examples of transformation projects contained in the strategy that meet the criteria for applying this flexibility. In order to respond to the challenges we face, both old and new, we must continue to be prudent to ensure that we have stable finances for the future and are in a position to continue to deliver first class services to our residents. The continuing delay to the comprehensive spending review does not make our four year outlook more, more uh, makes our four year, sorry, does make our four year outlook more uncertain. And given that this was already challenging for us, this is a worry. But it is not just about the finances. We must also continue to change the way we do things, which is why we have an ongoing transformation program. A key part of this is our customer strategy that was adopted in the summer of 2018. We will ensure that we interact with our residents in the ways they want, and this will increasingly use technology to provide a better experience at a lower cost. The latest example of this is the recently launched chatbot service, which is already proving popular. The Cabinet believes that this budget is a sound one and keeps us on the right path so that we can continue to, to deliver the services our residents need and want. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Before we move to ask for a seconder, um, can I just say to everyone, can you, could all members refrain from using the chat box? Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions or debate later on on this paper. So please don't use the chat box during um, this meeting. Thank you. Um, right, may I have a seconder, please? Councillor Arthi, are you um, wishing to second this? Yes, thank you. Oh, 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'll happily second. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to speak now or do you want to reserve your right to speak later? I'll reserve my right to later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jameson, um, I believe you wish to propose an amendment. Uh, may I just draw uh, members' attention, in case they're not aware, the amendments that we're going to be looking at are on page 89 of your papers. Um, so, Councillor Jameson, I wish you to, I believe you wish to propose an amendment from the Green Group. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. But before I start, could um, you ask Councillor Wall to retract his statement at the start of that um, presentation, which I'm sure he regrets now. Um, if, if members have concerns they want to bring to um, to council, it is not really, it's not deemed childish, particularly if it's been raised by residents. So I'm sure he didn't mean it as it came across, but it was it's not very good. OK, thank you. You've made you've made that statement. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks again. Would you like to move on with your yep. amendment, yep, please? Definitely. Um, the amendments that we are presenting today aim to cover key topics important to our residents, planning, planning and community needs, biodiversity and the planning committee. The sorry. Uh, yeah, and the, and the climate crisis. Many of our communities feel that they are under siege by developers. They have no faith in the council or the planning committee and no confidence in decisions made. They then have little expectation that we will hold developers to account if the planning conditions are ignored. To restore faith, it is essential that planners and planning committees impose conditions that work for communities and that the conditions are enforced. We propose a second, an extra officer should join the hard pressed team. Our council should have the resource, time and training to ensure developers contribute a fair share of their gains to enhance the communities from which they are profiting. To further improve the confidence of our residents, we recommend that all planning committee members undertake regular yeah. training. Our amendments have allocated £47,000 and £10,000 respectively for these improvements. It is often the local community that is best placed to identify a housing need. To help and encourage community projects to meet these needs, we feel that the pre-application advice for these applications should be free. £10,000 has been allocated for this. Communities have seen unprecedented numbers of people turn to food banks over the last year. Unemployment data released to November has shown a continuing increase. The rise is likely to continue following the second wave, as is the number of people turning to support. While the council has done and continued to do a great job in supporting our residents, we believe further support of the CAB and local food banks will be required for the forthcoming year. We are proposing a £50,000 grant to each. If coronavirus is the rainy day that we should have been putting away for, then the climate and biodiversity crisis is a hurricane just over the horizon that we need to avoid. Biodiversity is in serious decline globally. Last year's Living Planet report shows an average 68% decline in animal population sizes since 1970, and the 2019 State of Nature report found 41% of UK species are in decline and one in 10 is threatened with extinction. To enhance biodiversity task force proposals, we are proposing further work in two areas. An additional tree officer to facilitate proactive management of trees on council owned land and to protect more valued and ancient trees with tree preservation orders. And they will also ensure approved planting schemes are carried out and maintained as developments are implemented. We then, then feel there is a need for a dedicated biodiversity officer to work with local communities and businesses to actively look for and implement opportunities to increase biodiversity in the district. It is imperative that we prevent further biodiversity loss and the officer will also look to prevent this. We are including a sum of £94,000 to cover these two officers. We have mentioned many times that if we're going to stand a chance of meeting the council's climate commitments, then we need to facilitate a shift from car dependency to travel by foot, bicycle and bus. We also need to target the energy used to heat and run our homes. To reach carbon zero by 2030, we need to both massively 
a massive reduction in car use and a massive switch to electric vehicles. We are therefore proposing a sum of £30,000 to allow installation of electric charging points in our public car parks, including at Pin Mill. We are also recommending that when charging is implemented in our car parks, that any electric charging spaces are free while in use. In addition to this, we would like to see that all profits generated from car parking charges, once ongoing maintenance costs are considered, is ring fenced for, pub for sustainable transport, rather than a proportion as agreed. We would like to see the council undertake a zero carbon travel plan to identify and cost the path for this council to reach zero carbon travel by 2030 and use that plan to help identify suitable uses of ring fence money and other funding sources. We have allowed £4,000 for an officer's time to complete this work. Jumping back to Amendment 3, it is critical that we improve existing housing stock and move them to carbon zero. We are proposing an officer be dedicated to support the retrofit program of our stock, to support a program of retrofitting private homes and to ensure new builds are built to the highest environmental standards. £40,000 has been allocated to this. This completes the amendments that we are proposing for the General Fund, which will come from the Transformation Fund. We support the creation of a Transformation Fund and given the urgency of the climate and biodiversity crisis, now is the time to start transforming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Could I have a seconder, please? Do I have a seconder, please? Yeah, I'll second him, um, Councillor. Is Councillor Creswell? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes. Sorry, Chair, I, I, I couldn't find the button in time. I, I, um, oh, so, um, sorry, I'm, I've been told Councillor Lindsay's got to do it. Uh, no, that is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, Councillor Lindsay, please continue. Uh, you, could I could I reserve my right to to yes, speak later? Yes, of course you can. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Fine. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the amendment has been seconded. Uh, Councillor Ward, do you accept this an amendment or any element of it? There were four elements. Um, no, uh, the, uh, I don't. These amendments fall into four broad categories, planning, communities, environment. And Councillor Ward, could I ask you to turn your camera off? We're having a few problems um, with your with the transmission, um, so it might help if you could turn your camera off, please, and that might stop the freezing that's sometimes happening. OK, so, okay yeah, so, um, so uh, no, um, uh, these amendments fall into four broad categories, planning, communities, environment and housing. And my cabinet colleagues for each of those areas will respond shortly to, to each of those um, items. So um, no, I'm afraid we don't accept the amendments at the moment. No. Thank you. OK, thank you. So in that case, um, we're going to have to debate on the amendment. Uh, as I said, the amendment um, breaks into four different categories, as John Ward has just said too. Um, councillors will be able to speak once for three minutes, and this will be timed. So we're now speaking to the amendment only. Um, is that Councillor Arthur? Have, have you got your hand up? I have, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Arthur, would you like to begin, please? The okay. Debate? Um, well, firstly, I'll say that I actually agree with many of the issues um, that Councillor Jameson has, has raised, and I appreciate um, that he's um, taken the trouble to cost all of the proposals, but I don't think this is the way to achieve them. Um, I would much rather see some evidence behind what he sees as the shortfall rather than just sort of some anecdotal comments. Um, and to me, it seems like these proposals have kind of been plucked out of the sky. Um, I'll address some of them. Um, the first one, I think, is on page, ooh, is it 88 where it starts? 89. 89, which is planning enforcement. Um, and I don't think the way to address this is just to pull out a figure and put it in the in the budget. Um, enforcement, as I'm sure everybody knows, has been going through a, a transformational period. Um, planning enforcement now um, under Phil Isbell, um, team leader uh, Simon Bailey. 
And if there's a need for additional resource here, um, that request should properly come from Simon, should go through Phil, should go through Tom, and ultimately, that's Tom Barker, and ultimately the head of the paid service is our chief executive. Um, and how we provide the services that we have to provide is something that should be dealt with by those people um, who are providing them. So um, if, if I just run through, I don't know how much I'll get through in my time. Um, the training and advice for planning committees, I absolutely agree with that. Again, I don't think just throwing money at it is, is the way to achieve it. Um, I will be having ongoing discussions um, with Tom Barker and Phil Isbell um, about what I think is a, a need for additional training. Um, some time ago, um, when I was chairman of committee, which is about 15 or 20 years ago, um, I think we had a more comprehensive um, training regime than the one that we've got now. Um, so I'd be happy to explore um, ways in which we can uh, uh, in, improve our training. Um, the free pre-application advice for community needs, again, this looks as though it's just throwing money at something. Um, I'm not quite sure whether offering free pre-app for any community initiative is actually the way to address things. I mean, we could end up lining ourselves up with a whole load of additional work unnecessarily um, for sort of um, not exactly frivolous um, proposals, but just for, you know, sort of investigative type stuff. Um, so I don't know whether that's the, the right way to, to attack that. Um, I'll comment on a few others that don't come under the, the planning portfolio while I've you got have time. 30 seconds left. OK, um, I'll go on to EV charger points then. I don't think the general fund is the way um, to increase the rollout of electric vehicle charger points. Um, SIL is a much better way to fund that. Um, we've already funded some of our points through SIL. We've got six going in in Lavenham at the moment under a SIL bid. Um, so I agree with the principles behind everything that's been said, but I don't think that throwing money at it from the general fund is the way to achieve what Lee um, Thank, you, Thank you, Councillor Thank you. Councillor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will be voting for the amendment because I think we cannot continue with business as normal when climate change, and I'm quoting here David Attenborough, who's been speaking on the news just this very night, Climate change is the biggest threat to humanity's continued existence that mankind has ever faced. David Attenborough feels it's possibly too late already. I hear what Councillor Arthur is saying, um, that perhaps there may be other ways of doing these things, but, but at some point we've got to stop talking about it and we've got to do something. It's what we Greens were elected for, I believe. There are four Greens on Baby District Council now, and we do need to speak up for the people who elected us. Um, and OK, so perhaps the, uh, there might be another way of addressing the pre-planning issue. But, well, let's find the other way then. Let's find the mechanism. Let's do it. Let's start acting. And let's start acting as if climate change is real before it's too late. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gould. Councillor Malvisi. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And uh, before I start, can I address the biodiversity element and parking in one, or do I get two shots? No, you get one shot, <laughs> and this is it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, um, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> As both councillors know, um, we've got a biodiversity action plan, and we can't really plant the wrong tree in the wrong place because we need to do a mapping exercise to identify the right place for the right tree. So they both know that we've got this going on now. And maybe they don't know that our corporate manager who has the necessary skills um, <clears throat> is liaising with Taylor Wimpy on the Chiltern Woods on the biodiversity aspect of everything. It would be nice to have an additional tree officer, but we need to define the need and determine the need because we need to spend money and that money would have to come from the, the transformation fund. EV charging capability, <clears throat> we are addressing it. We're doing solar carports at Kingfisher Leisure, leisure Centres and in a load of other places around, around the, the district. 
The joint local plan requires that the supply cable is taken up to the property, but they are not required to install EV charging points. And that really isn't our job because it's up to individual choice. We do have a sustainable travel officer, so we don't need to go and find another one. The parking, we will be conducting a strategic parking review and that will address all the issues, but it takes 18 months to two years to come into effect to, to get to recommendation stage. The new tariffs will not make a profit if there is anything left over, it is not considered a profit, but it is to be ring fenced and used for sustainable transport and other travel options. But as I said, both councillors know that this is in the pipeline. It's part of what we discussed. But I would like to draw attention that the solar carport project for Kingfisher has attracted £400,000 um, bid. Active travel cycle storage in Sudbury, 25,000. Decarbonisation of leisure centres in Hadley and Kingfisher amount to 671,000. So, Baber has been working. You have 30 seconds left. have been working. I'm concluded, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Malvisi. Councillor Jan Osborne. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm leaving my video off because, like John, I have some um, IT problems today. So, um, right, on the proposal for an officer to be dedicated to support the retrofit programme of our housing stock, um, discussions is already taking place at the level of EPC that homes will need to meet is taking place in central government and was subject to um, consultation mm, before COVID several months ago. At Baber, we are ahead of the game and uh, we have already defined and funded in the 21-22 budget a role for an energy efficiency surveyor to work with the private sector. Also, we are looking at uh, national grant opportunities to attract funding to support private landlords and would like to support this further with our own grant offer for improvements to private rented accommodation. So actually, the amendment is the request for this is already um, being accounted for in the 21-22 budget, which is before us today for approval. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll just quickly address the um, the communities issue in terms of the uh, funding for the CABs. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure uh, other councils be aware that we've already discussed um, given the CABs um, £53,000. It was at the Cabinet briefing, it was at the Cabinet meeting, it was at overview and scrutiny. And uh, and so, again, uh, as my other colleagues, Cabinet colleagues have pointed out, these things are already being addressed. Um, but we knew these questions were coming up, obviously, but we've also seen that, uh, mid that it's, it's remarkably similar amendments to Mid-Suffolk and the Greens there withdrew theirs. Um, you know, we're, we're already dealing with this. So, freely, I, I, I just want to reiterate, all councillors are welcome to come to the briefings, are welcome to come to the meetings, both Cabinet and Scrutiny. And if they want to discuss things, they've got ideas, we'd be more than happy to listen to them. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor McCraw. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think in some ways we're coming back to an element of disconnect. Uh, the opportunities do exist. I know because I go to nearly everything I possibly can. And the reason I can't support the amendments is because, well, the three reasons. One, that as Councillor Arthur has pointed out, there isn't an evidence base provided. We'd normally use an evidence base for decisions. I, it's my watchword. So these become wishes. And, you know, in some cases, I'd happily support them if we had the money, but we don't, unlike Mid-Suffolk, who do have the money, and yet the amendments were withdrawn there. I find some disconnect in itself there. But more importantly, and I think most importantly, the budget papers before us today forecast a series of gaps for the next three years, quite large ones. Uh, 
facing that in that light, using reserves for what has to be repeat spending, uh, adding new stuff, extra officers is a repeat spend. That is going to take away from our running costs and and our cap our running costs for the future. And I don't think in these circumstances that can be warranted. In fact, our Section 151 officer in Appendix B of the papers before you, on um, paragraph 28 on page 63 of the papers, specifically warns in our situation against using reserves. We are trying to redress a loss of reserves or a potential loss of reserves. So in these circumstances, there's no reason, there's no sense, frankly, in committing ourselves to increased regular spending for the foreseeable future. And finally, specifically, the staff complement is a matter for the head of paid service, the chief executive and all the directors and, and, and assistant directors and officers underneath them, because they are the ones who can best assess the requirements. Politically, we can ask for these things, we can suggest these things, the cabinet will do so, but we have to look at our overall running costs because that is what a budget is about. So I can't support any of these amendments, much as if I'd like to, because I believe they're entirely worthy and a variety of areas, citizens advice, food banks, all this stuff, nice if we can afford it, we can't, I'm afraid. Thank you, Councillor McCraw. Councillor Maybury. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, uh, I do have to say that I can't comment on every single item um, on on this uh, because of the reasons already declared. Um, but I would like to say that I would support additional planning enforcement because I have actually had um, cause to speak to enforcement um, in the last. 24 hours on a couple of occasions um, and I think that they are doing a splendid job and that they actually do need some more support, um, some more facility uh, in their capacity. So I would support that. Um, I never think that any training is a waste of time. Um, you can always glean something from, from training, so that is also valid. Um, and to when we come to the free pre-application advice for community needs, we are emerging from post-COVID. And I do remember that we were promised a post-COVID plan, which I have not seen. If there is one, please could someone send me a copy? Because I think that there will be a huge need within communities, any community, and this may be a way of helping the local communities. And that can be anywhere from Shotley through to Sudbury, through to the north of, of the area and even even down to um, East Burgholt. So I would support that as well. Food banks. This is the first time I've ever seen a comment about food banks um, having some application of um, finance from a district council here and I must say I have always heard some very negative comments um, about food banks um, and I know that the councillors know who they are and I'm not going to mention them at this point but I do remember visiting with certain members food banks um, within the local area so I would support that as well Another item that I would definitely support is an additional tree officer, because I well remember in my time on the cabinet, which I very much enjoyed, and I did do my best, and officers said I did a really good job, that we were actually short of capacity to help with TPOs and the removal of hedges during planning applications. So I would support that too. There are some very valid points and thank you for bringing it forward, my Green colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mabry. Councillor Creswell. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I'd like to say thank you to Philly for quite a good presentation and giving me some knowledge that I hadn't got. Um, and I agree with uh, Councillor Gould that um, I didn't see the David Attenborough thing, but we all know how fast we need to get things moving regards climate change. We see the ice caps melting. We hear things like the sea level's going to raise. We get um, where we talk um, Taylor Wimpy and uh, Chilton Woods, where they're going to build 11, 1200 homes and uh, probably use gas boilers, gas central heating, which are going to go, which aren't meant to be used. I think it's five years, I may be wrong. Um, and we need to look at alternatives. And um, for that reason, I, I will agree with the amendments. I think green changes are definitely needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Creswell. Councillor Hinton. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, there's some very good points within this amendment, uh, but one of the things that they haven't really, in my opinion, grasped is where we can actually save money on this to be able to finance some of these initiatives. Uh, I had a quick look through the through the papers uh, in preparation for this meeting, and I noticed that our accommodation costs are going up by 128,000 next year. Well, with everybody working from home and Endeavour House probably three quarters empty, uh, why is it costing us 128,000 more to have fewer people working in the offices? So there, are, there is scope for some uh, savings to be made. As far as the green initiatives are concerned, I agree with the, the thoughts on tree offices and on planning, which protects green initiatives like hedge, ancient hedges and ancient trees. In actual fact, the MPPF already does that, but it seems to get ignored when it comes to planning applications and they seem to get removed with remarkable ease. And yet we then make a big thing about planting a tree for every newborn. But that's a little whip. If you're taking out a 100, 200 year old oak tree, there's a lot more carbon stored up in that than there is in the whip that's been put in. And it takes a long time for that whip to actually produce any real meaningful carbon savings. So we've got to get a, a grip of these sorts of things and to look at them in a much more logical fashion and throw out some of the dogma uh, and look at reducing costs as well as providing uh, funding for other services. Thank you, Councillor Hinton. Um, if there are no other people who want to join the debate, um, I'll invite Councillor Jameson. Oh, oh yes, Councillor Lindsay, I, I believe you reserved your right to speak. Did you want to say anything? Um, yes, please, Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I listened to all the comments with a great deal of interest. Um, but I can't help thinking that everything that they've been saying, they've been forced to say it, these cabinet members, have been forced to come out and say, well, this is what we're doing here, this is what we're doing there. By the fact that we've filed these, this motion. And, you know, frankly, that's, that's not good enough. You know, if we, um, what we're talking about here is some very modest sums. We're not going to bankrupt the council. A few thousand there, a few a few thousand here. Um, what it's about is what it says about our priorities as a council. And and if these things aren't spelt out in our in the budget that that's brought before us that by, by this cabinet, then we have every right to push for them. And you know it's you know every anyone who who votes against these these amendment needs to ask themselves. Are the cabinet members and the leader doing enough on these, all these things, all these items that we've mentioned? Are they really going to happen? Um, you know, we've heard the talking about, oh, it's OK, our, our officers are talking to Taylor Wimpy about biodiversity, so that's OK. But you know, we know, we all know our officers are overworked. And, uh, uh, you know, every time we, we hear on the great time, Planning enforcement, that overwork, they can't keep up. Um, viability wasn't was skirted over um, by um, Councillor Arthi. But we, we need to hold developers, you know, to the wall and say to them, when you when they say, Oh, we can't, we can't afford this, it's not viable, 
we need the, the experienced and the trained staff to be able to hold them to account and say, well, actually, come on and haggle with them and, and, and actually force them to come up with some benefits for the community out of the profits they make out of developments. Um, uh, the cabinet members are saying, it's OK, we'll leave it to our chief executive to decide about staffing. But he's got a, a limited budget. It's up to the cabinet members and the politicians to set the priorities. And one of the ways you can do that is to say, come on, have we really got enough staff here, Chief Executive, in this area of planning enforcement? Have we got enough staff in biodiversity, given that that's one of our priorities? Have we got enough staff to tackle the climate crisis, given that we've said it's our priority? And, and really cross-question that, really challenge that. And this is one way we're doing it. So I'd urge you to support this motion because it ain't going to have a lot of impact on our reserves but it is going to have an impact on how the public and how the whole council views our priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lindsay. Councillor Horan, um, you put your hand up rather late. Is there something you wanted to add? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman. Um, I did put it up earlier, but it, it fell down again, I think. So my <laughs> apologies. Um, <laughs> One of the problems like of this technical age. I would just like to make the point, Madam Chairman, to everybody that um, if you're going to have a change of direction, uh, you need to be thinking about it over a long period of time. There's lots of comment here about extra staff, but maybe we don't need extra staff. Maybe we just need to divert some of the staff we have to doing different things. I do find it extremely odd that we have got six members of staff, I'm told, across Baby Mid Suffolk, employed in the comms team. Um, now, I tend to think if you need six members of staff um, trumpeting what you're doing, maybe we're not doing a very good job anyway. I'm not sh saying that those members of staff could be um, put into the sort of work we're talking tonight, but in long term planning, you need the right people doing the right things. So it may not be employing extra people it may be getting the people we've got doing what we need them to do and this could be one of the things we need to spend money where it's going to help us in the future that is my point i'll probably support this motion just to get the numbers up because um for god's sake we do need to be doing something about this we talk about lots of things um which are important but this is most important if we don't react um it's going to kill us all so I will support the motion just to be damn minded, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Horan. So I'll return now to Councillor Jameson um, as the proposer of the amendment. Is there anything else you wish to add? Um, only that um, I find it, I was quite disappointed to find that some members can't see anything within these um, amendments that are important enough to spend money on. And the only other thing I'd like to comment Councillor, Councillor Malvisi seemed to be under the impression we were proposing electric charging points on private properties. It was just for our car parks. And also, we were not looking for an extra sustainability travel office. So it's just um, the time of some of the sustainability officers' time to um, produce a travel plan. But, um, other than that, no, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Council Ward, was there anything else you wish to add before we go to the vote? Yeah, yeah, just um, uh, a couple of quick points. Um, uh, firstly, I want to say that we are committed to our climate change mitigation objectives and the evidence of this is clear and we really are doing uh, as much as we can. We care as much as the Greens. This budget amendment is a mixed bag with some good ideas, many things we are already doing and a couple that have merit, boosting enforcement, which we all agree, and extra support for our biodiversity action plan. But there are others, as you've heard, that are simply not needed. There's no evidence of any additional need, uh, any need for additional funds for the Sudbury CAB. They currently have a good financial position and haven't asked for any more. Similarly, there's no evidence for the need for a one-off grant for our food banks. There are other funding sources available to them. Apparently, Councillor Osborne offered some money from her locality budget, which was declined. We are in regular contact and will be happy to support if necessary. We already give support as part of the wider county response to COVID. No food bank is lacking support and all are well-funded and organised. 
The associate directors can look at the two that we could implement and decide how they could be delivered and then make requests for staffing requirements to the head of paid service based on need. The budget is not the place, however, for determining this. Any costs that we may incur in the current year can be met from the transformation fund. That's all I'd like to say, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. So in a moment, we're going to be voting on the amendments and we'll be doing four votes, taking them each as um, separate items. So we'll be doing that in just a moment. In accordance with Council Procedure Rule 19.3, immediately after any vote is taken at a budget decision meeting of the Council, the names of councillors who cast a vote for the decision or against the decision or who abstain from voting shall be recorded in the minutes of that meeting. I'm proposing that we take each um, element of the amendment separately. I will now ask the corporate manager of governance and civic office to conduct the recorded vote on part one of the amendment planning and community needs. The amendment can be found at page 89 in modern gov. So vote one, amendment part one, planning and community needs. Madam Chairman, um, it's Councillor Maybury here, and I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I would like some guidance as to whether or not I'm able to vote on this, considering my declaration previously that I am a director of Citizens Advice. Sub I'll ask our District. monitoring officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. I believe Councillor Maybury made a local non-pecuniary declaration of interest, which means she is able to vote on this amendment and on the budget uh, recommendations when we get to that part of, of the debate and the vote. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very so, much for that advice. Thank you. We'll now move to the vote. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, can you please open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting. The voting tab for this agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote. Thank you. Chair, just clarification. This is voting on the amendment, isn't it? That's correct. Only on okay. the amendment, not on the whole paper. It's to accept you, or sir. not the first element of the yeah, amendment, part one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Beer and Councillor Dawson, we're still awaiting your vote. Are you OK or are you having technical issues? No, mine's stuck, Councillor Dawson. I can't even get to the vote. <laughs> OK, would you like to vote manually then? Would you like to say whether you're voting for Amendment Part 1, um, Planning and Community Needs, for or against? Against. Thank you. And Councillor Beer, are you able to vote? Um, unfortunately, I cannot get the little bar to slide up and down to move it. I've got it all in front, but it won't allow me to move the fin to vote. Um, okay. So I'm voting mm. against the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. So annoying. Let's see if I can get that to do that. Chair, the, the vote is 10 for and 22 against part one of the amendment. Thank you. So that amendment is lost. We'll now move on to the next vote. I'll now ask the corporate manager, governor and civic office to conduct the recorded vote on part two of the amendment, which is on biodiversity and environment. 
Thank you, Chair. Again, councillors, can you open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting? In the voting tab, the vote for this agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote and you may need to tab down to find the blue line. Thank you. Again, I cannot make it go down the blue line to appear or even go down it. Likewise, Dawson. OK, I would, um, councillors, if that's the case, would you like to, um, to, to give your vote manually? It's ridiculous because it was working to start with. Um, I'm against the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Beer and Councillor Dawson. Against. Thank you. I've got it working now. Chair, that is um, the votes are 10 for and 22 against. Thank you. So that element of the vote is lost. I'll now ask the corporate manager, governor and civic office to conduct the recorded vote on part three of the amendment, which is on housing and climate change. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, if you go to the top right hand side of the screen and select attendance and voting, the voting tab will show blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote. Thank you. Well, I think I got it working this time. Don't ask me why, but it is coming up. Uh, is that vote on item three? Sorry, um, Madam Chair. That is item three. That's Thank correct. You. I'm talking to myself and trying to find out. <laughs> I've forgotten what I've got to do. I've gone into blue. I've got to press that, haven't I? Ah, yes, there we are. Um, perhaps the officer can. Jan uh, Dawson, I'm against. OK, thank you. And Councillor Beer, we have yours now, so thank you. Chair, the voting is as follows, 8, 4 and 24 against the part three of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. So that amendment is lost. I will now ask the corporate manager, governance and civic office to conduct the recorded vote on part four of the amendment, which is on travel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Again, councillors, please can you open the vote by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting. The agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dawson against. OK, thank you, Councillor Dawson. Hinton, we're still waiting for your vote. Are you having technical difficulties or would you like to um, give your vote manually? Councillor Hinton? Oh, you got it. Thank you. We have your vote now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The voting for the fourth element is 9-4 and 23 against. Thank you. OK, so that um, amendment is, is lost. 
So we will now return to the original motion for questions and debate. Um, we will now move to questions first. Councillors may ask as many questions as they wish. However, they must be relevant to the subject under discussion and must be a question. Have we got anyone who'd like to ask a question, please? This is on the original um, paper. Councillor Fraser. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, may I ask a, a question on clarification, please? Yes, you may. Please do. Uh, on the uh, main text, page 43, paragraph 8.19. Uh, on the income section, uh, there's a bullet uh, stating about the implementation of short term car parking charges from October 2021 across the district. Uh, this dates um, not precise. It's a bit vague. Uh, we understood that uh, parking charges weren't going to be brought in before October 21. But may I ask um, when a precise date would be decided? Um, so which date will parking charges be implemented from? Uh, who would make this decision? And what would be the criteria on setting the date, please? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ward, are you going to answer this? Or? Uh, yes, I, I can answer that. Um, as Councillor Fraser has has pointed out, it, it's a, a not before date and, and it, it's not precise because we do not know how things are going to develop this year. Um, it, it could be later than that, um, in which case the uh, potential in additional income for this year would be less than the amount specified. But we have to put a date and a figure in the budget for, for budgetary purposes. Should the date slip, should that number um, decrease, then that will be managed through the regular quarterly um, monitoring reports next year. But in terms of the uh, decision making, Cabinet will obviously make that final decision as to the date and will take into account um, an assessment of how uh, our, our high streets, our businesses um, are recovering as we go into the summer and autumn. Um, it all depends on the success of the uh, the measures that the government's taking to, to ease lockdown, uh, hopefully with a full um, back to normal on the 21st of, of June. So um, we will monitor this carefully over the coming months and, and then make a decision. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, has that answered your question, Councillor Fraser? Yes, thank you. And I'm grateful for to Councillor Ward for that full explanation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Maybury. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is on the garden waste um, brown bins. However, one would like to uh, to to identify this um, with the garden waste um, refuse collection. Uh, could the portfolio holder confirm that refunds because of the non collection have been taken into account in in the budget as described? on page, oh, I've got page four out of 16. Thank you. Councillor Ward. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry Councillor Ward. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yes, they have been taken into account. Fine. D does that answer your question, Councillor Maybury? Um, well, dep depends when these figures um, would put in, because obviously the brown bins are not being collected at the moment. Um, and when I asked last week, I was told it would be another month. Um, brown bins will be collected, all things being equal, week commencing the 8th of March. Um, this is a budget and therefore budgetary figures go in. Then we're not discussing actuals. Thank you, but that's really helpful for me to be able to inform my residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dawson. Um, yes. 
Yes, if I could just come back to um, the comments by John, it'd be really helpful to have real clarification on this business about the dates, because my understanding is that the tariffs are going to come in on the 1st of October, and there's been no question about this. So it'd be really helpful if he could just really clarify if businesses and councillors, uh, particularly in Hadley, if we come to you and half your group are asking you not to introduce these tariffs, can you confirm that you won't be doing that on the 1st of October? I, I can't what? confirm anything of the okay. sort. As I, as I said, um, the 1st of October is, is the uh, not before date, and it will depend on the recovery uh, over the next few months um, through the summer and into the autumn. And we will take, make that decision based on uh, an assessment of business recovery. And that, and that uh, I can't say any more than that, I'm afraid. Well, if I could just come back on that, um, you know, we've been saying all along, uh, because of COVID, there's absolutely no doubt about it. The high streets in Hadley, in Sudley, and, uh, and all around the rural communities have really suffered. And uh, th I think you know very well, we've been very clear about the fact that, that this never should have been introduced. The timing of this is really appalling with the car parking. And... Uh, you know, having a cabinet, the problem is here is you've got a few people deciding on behalf of the majority. And, uh, you know, I was one of the few people uh, five years ago who was very anti-voting for a cabinet because they don't, it's not representative of everybody. So Can I we would keep like, this to the point and make it yes, a question? So I would, yes, so I would really like to try and drill this down with you. We asked for a deferment on the tariffs and it, this was declined. And there's no doubt that the cabinet haven't listened to uh, the request to have this deferred. So what is your criteria for the 1st of October, whether you go ahead or not go ahead? Is it going to be officers or is it going to be the same few people that make the decision? Because there's certainly no consultation on this at all. Uh, Councillor Dawson, um, we're, we're discussing the budget, not not parking. Um, but uh, as I said, the uh, we, we have actually compromised on this. We pushed the date back as a result of um, uh, feedback and as a result of um, the uh, report from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. So there has been some compromise. Um, I can't say any more than what I've just said earlier in, in answer to Councillor Fraser. And, and um, quite honestly, I, I I, I can't say anything more now. Um, the decision, how it's going to be done. The decision will be made by Cabinet based on an assessment of the recovery. And that's, yeah. that's um, as I said to Councillor Fraser, but we're not here to discuss parking, we're here to discuss the budget. No, it's just follow on Councillor Fraser's question. May I just ask um, Councillor Ward um, how you'll be measuring that recovery? Well, that's what I've asked. Um, we haven't um, uh, worked that out yet, um, but uh, we'll, we'll let members know once that's you'll, done. You'll let us know. Yeah, okay, of course. Okay, you'll, yeah, you'll yeah. inform members. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hurran. Chairman, thank you. Sorry to be a bit slow on the buttons, but um, I, I was also going to raise that point, Madam Chairman, because I do feel strongly that um, car parking charges should not have been brought in in um, the upcoming financial year. I think let's get a grip on this. Um, I know there's going to be various studies and things done, but I would have liked to, to have a clear year. And I've made this point to John. I don't know if he wants to comment on it now, but I think that would be clean and um, give us a lot more credibility as well to have a year without them. I know it's got, the money's got to come from somewhere and I'm well aware of that. And I do tend to think that car park and charges are not going to raise much revenue for us anyway. So uh, leave it alone for a year would, um, would please this count and a lot of people as well. A couple of general questions on the paper as well. Um, once again on page 43, third bullet point down. I see we're to be charged another 43,000 for service charges for Endeavour House. And in my view, John, that tends to be going the wrong way as we haven't been there and the windows don't need cleaning and um, not so much sweeping up and things. I'm just, I know John is going to ask a separate question as well about um, another matter on this, but I'm asking this one, why is it going up when I think really it should be going down? 
And quickly, maybe one for um, Councillor Malvisi. On the transport just below, um, there's something about it's going to cost 64k. Um, no, I'm wrong one. Uh, yeah, the hydrated vegetable oil, which I was told was going to be cheaper and less engine maintenance, and yet that's um, attracting another 88k on the budget. And I was very surprised at this because in the um, press reports that were put out, we were told there's a saving on the fuel and a saving on engine maintenance. And in the budget, it's um, 88k, um, k more. So clarification on those two points, please. And, I think um, there were three, in fact. Well, <laughs> it was the first parking, one was, yeah, the first one was a comment House. on the parking. The first one was yeah. a comment on the parking, which um, yeah. was a point of view. The other two are straight questions, um, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, OK, thanks. Uh, I, I won't comment any more on parking. Um, uh, it's not the, the place for parking, uh, the parking debate. Um, in terms of the uh, hydrogenated vegetable oil, um, or hydro tree oil, to use its correct term, uh, the fuel is more expensive than diesel. There is a price differential that varies, um, and that £88,000 is an average of that price differential. So it is a more expensive fuel. But as I said in my introduction, our transport cost savings uh, will largely compensate for this in, in the first year. But it's, um, it's a green measure, and green measures, um, many of them do come at a price. And uh, um, and we have to accept those prices as as um, as part of uh, going green because for this this particular saving the the, the carbon reduction is it's the biggest component of our um, uh, uh, carbon footprint and it will have a, a huge um, effect on on our ability to meet our uh, climate um, uh, commitments. In terms of Endeavour House, um, I understand we uh, the first few years of occupancy were, were at a discount. Um, uh, that's now ended, um, and we did in, uh, agree increments at the start of the lease, and the £43,000 reflects those increments. Um, but I do believe that uh, there are some uh, budget negotiations in place. I don't know if the Chief Executive would uh, like to comment further on this uh, at this point, um, just for further clarification for, for Councillor Huron. Thank you. Yes. We have our Chief Executive here. Thank you, Madam Chairman, um, and thank you, Councillor Ward. Uh, yes, I can just confirm that we are having those conversations with Suffolk County Council uh, to try and negotiate that back down. Uh, Councillor Ward is absolutely right. The reason for the increase is because we did a fantastic deal when we moved in uh, and we had a discounted rate for the first two years uh, that was always due to come uh, to an end at this point. Uh, and we are, in addition to that, exploring whether or not, as a result of the, the excellent working that we've been able to do throughout the COVID crisis, working in a much more agile, more remote way uh, we believe we won't need as much space within Endeavour House uh, for the future so we are exploring whether it be possible uh, to reduce our floor plate floor template uh, as, as a result uh, which clearly would have a knock-on impact not just in terms of service charge but also in terms of rent. Yes uh, Chairman can I just thank Arthur for that um, yes. we have we have discussed this before and um, I look to be um, regularly briefed on this situation thank you Madam Chairman. Thank you Councillor Horan. Councillor Maybury. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say that um, the discounts on Endeavour House were thanks to um, Councillor Jenkins, um, I am reminded. Um, I would like to ask a question on Appendix D, page four, under sustainable communities. I was first shocked and then absolutely delighted because it appears that our chief planning officer earns 1,222,000. So congratulations to him. Um, but if someone could confirm that that is his salary. Thank you. <laughs> uh. Have we got someone here who can uh, yeah, answer I, I think, that? Um, if I can pass that over to um, one of the finance team. Um, I, I've found the particular page that Councillor Maybury is referring to, but... Um, oh, we have Catherine Steele here. I, I think Catherine, that's the whole, like the whole planning that, team, to be quite honest, rather than the chief planning officer. <laughs> Catherine. 
thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, Council Award it is for the whole team that uh, it works under the Chief Planning Officer, not just him. Thank you. Um, if I may come back, um, Chairman. Um, having looked through Appendix D, uh, this is the only officer that um, declares that they uh, that they are head of services because every other item is under something that we would that we would actually understand such as building control well there's a group of people economy and business there's there's a group of people um so i'm i must say that i think that that needs rewording another year but i must say i do send my congratulations to our chief planning officer for earning that amount of money um, and not compromising myself, but I could become his very best friend. But I'm not putting myself in a compromising position, but well done to him. And I might speak to him tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we'll move quickly on from there. Um, Councillor Holt. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to go back to Parkin to a certain extent to try and put some clarity, certainly from an economic team point of view, and just try and reassure members that um, we will be working closely with both Chamber of Commerce in Hadley and Sudbury, um, and certainly the town centre manager in Sudbury. And, and I'd really like to encourage all members to, to feed back to myself and the economic team of anything locally. And we have a roadmap now out of recovery set by government yesterday. And I think it's important that uh, we acknowledge that really the recovery is not going to start till the summertime. Um, and I think it would be naive of us to try and put any sort of date on it. I think what we've got at the moment is from October the 1st, it makes perfect sense. Um, we're just going to have to see how that recovery goes, see how how our high streets do perform in the coming months and gauge where where we sit, perhaps October, November. Personally, I think it may well be into the new year when we see uh, recovery to a point when parking charges may be introduced or may be implemented. But I just want to try and reassure members that the economic team will be working closely with the, both Chamber of Commerce um, and the town councils actually uh, to just gauge how we are all doing, how the high street's doing and how all our businesses are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holt. I think um, members will appreciate uh, that information. Uh, Councillor Barrett, have you a question? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, I, the debate has, has sort of kicked off a little yeah. bit about the premises. Yeah. Um, and I was going to just just ask about that. Um, uh, and um, it pleased to hear that there are there are discussions taking place to um, find a, a, a suitable solution to the rising costs of those premises. Um, can you tell us? Uh, can someone tell us how long a rental agreement uh, you're going to enter into? And if we don't get an agreement that's satisfactory, um, is that likely to mean moving to alternative offices? Um, we have our chief executive here to answer those questions. Thank yes, you. I'm not sure whether Councillor Ward wanted to, but I'm more than happy to try and answer that. So we're already in a lease arrangement. Uh, that is a, a binding contract. Our lease runs for 10 years. Uh, and, and you can see that we therefore have some some period to run until the end of that lease period. There is, however, a break clause at the halfway point, so after five years. Uh, and so the conversations that we've been having with the County Council are mutual conversations, if you like, alongside that contract. Uh, if the County Council wished to do so, they could enforce that contract and we would have to pay that service fee. Uh, but we have good relationships with our County Council and we're more mature and more sensible than simply relying upon a contractual arrangement. Uh, so the agreement that we would enter to, into would be a variation to the existing uh, agreement uh, and so would amend the service charge uh, for this initial period of time. What it doesn't do is change the length of the lease in any way, shape or form and nor does it change the break clause in that way, shape or form. So no, we're not exploring uh, the use of any other uh, accommodation at this point in time because we are contractually bound, as I say, to the County Council uh, in line with the agreement reached by this council uh, back in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Maybury, have you got a question? I, I have, and thank you, thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm 
do beg your pardon. I was hunting for the page number, but I still can't find it. Um, there is a comment um, within the paper um, paperwork for the budget that the public realm contract, which has not been um, agreed yet, that there's been an, an, an allowance for it. Uh, could someone actually confirm to me what the allowance is and how this has been taken into account in the budget, please? Thank you. Councillor Malvizu, would you want to answer this one? Oh, Cassandra. Yeah. Hello. Sorry, I was just switching my buttons off, but yeah. And Cassandra's, Cassandra's here as well. Um, to her. Bye. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the question. I thought I'd just jump in um, as I'm a little bit closer to the finances. So essentially, the um, originally the budget last year showed the cost of what the Idi Verdi contract was for. And the uh, figure that is in the budget before you today it is based on the paper that came to Cabinet around the decision to bring that contract back in house at the end of it. So the work that was done by the team that um, are managing this project um, are working that on the basis that we will be able to run that service for the same cost as what the Idi Verdi contract previously cost. So when we originally were looking at this, it, we were, it looked as if it could be more expensive to bring it back in house. However, the 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 people both at Overview and Scrutiny and at Cabinet were saying that actually the control back and the flexibility and the increased service standards were worth that and so the decision was taken. However, as that project has progressed, it does look um, increasingly like we're going to be able to do that within the previous budget that was set and that's what's in the paper before you today. Thank you. May I come back, um, Chairman? Yeah. Yes, please do. Um, my my other question is, does that actually include um, the vehicles, the service vehicles that will be needed for this project? So there is some capital purchases that, that need to be made and the figure that's in there includes the costs of those. So there will be some borrowing around that. Um, but we also clearly we own a number of our own vehicles anyway, and they were on a program uh, to be um, uh, you know, through the lifespan when they need to be replaced. Uh, so there's a combination of what was already due to be replaced and a combination of some borrowing. And and if my third and last question, Chairman, if I may, is yeah. and these new vehicles that will be purchased and the ones that we have at the moment, what fuel will they be using? We will absolutely endeavour to uh, look for alternative fuels to diesel. Um, clearly, all of our um, diesel vehicles will be moving to HVO. However, if we do have the opportunity to purchase electric sooner, then that's what we would look to do. Thank you. I shall look forward to seeing the figures next year. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hinton, have you a question? Yeah, question for going back a bit, just one step in actual fact to the chief executive. You mentioned a break clause at five years. Well, by my calculations, that five years is now. So can we, is it possible for us to exercise that break clause or are you just going to roll it on to the next five years um, and take it from there? Because when we made the original decision, we made it in the September uh, of one year but we hadn't even agreed a contract until the February of the following year. So I'm uh, just wondering when the, the decision actually started from. Thank you, Councillor Hinson, uh, and if, you, if I can, Chair. Um, so the the decision was, as you say, was made in 2016. However, we moved in and the contract uh, was entered into from October, November, I forget which month, 2017. Uh, so it's five years from 2017. So we haven't yet reached to that point. Uh, and I believe I'm right in thinking that there is a, <clears throat> a six month uh, notice period. So we haven't yet reached the point of needing, needing to serve notice. Uh, clearly, that's a conversation that we would have with the cabinet uh, at nearer the time. Uh, clearly, we wouldn't leave it to six months before, because if we wish to exercise uh, six months to leave, we need somewhere else to go to. Uh, but I've had no indications from councillors that that's something that they would wish to explore uh, that for all the reasons that we moved into Endeavour House in the first place. Councillor Mabry, have you got an, a question on this matter? Can I just come back on that? Sorry, uh, Chair. Um, oh. um, in response to, to Councillor Hinton, 
Um, you, you've got to remember that uh, this isn't a decision for Baber alone. Uh, this is a decision for, for both councils um, uh, because any any move from Endeavour House would have a financial impact on, on two councils. And um, we would need to make sure that whatever we did um, was uh, not going to increase the costs for either one or both of us. And indeed, if it uh, increased the cost of one, it would be for both. So um, we have to bear that in mind. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Councillor Mabry, did you have yes. a further question? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, th this is part comment, part question to the Chief Executive. Uh, to help him out, um, I am very reminded that it was September 2017 that we moved into Endeavour House. Uh, so would a month make a complete difference to breaking the contract. And the second is, if for any reason um, Mid-Suffolk said they wish to leave Endeavour House and Baber said they wish to stay or vice versa, what would happen, please? Um, in terms of the month making a difference, it, it will be the date that's on the contract, and I believe the date on the contract is October. Uh, but yes, it's around that period of time. Uh, in terms of what would happen, I, I'm afraid my crystal ball is broken uh, in that regard. Uh, it would be something that we would have to look at carefully. But clearly, what you have is a combined workforce. Uh, you don't have Baber employees separate from Mid Suffolk employees. So, as Councillor Ward indicated, I would suggest it needs to be a joint decision as to whether to, to leave or whether to stay. Uh, and that's not to say that you couldn't look to relocate the council chamber, of course. Uh, that is something that uh, is entirely at, at Baber's disposal, uh, but you would have to incur separate costs to the creation of that. And clearly, Mid Suffolk's not going to subsidise the creation of a, uh, of a separate uh, Hadley or, or Sudbury, for the sake of argument, uh, council chamber. Uh, but that's something that clearly uh, the leader in the cabinet and, and other councillors would want to take a view on it in due course uh, and we would also want to reflect on the fact that uh, our way of working has completely changed so whilst we all have the backdrop of the council chamber behind us clearly none of us are in it um, and I hope is that the government is going to agree to lots of local government lobbying that's going on at the moment to enable councils to have the choice as to whether or not they wish to return uh, when they can safely do so to face-to-face in-person meetings uh, or whether they they wish to remain holding virtual meetings or a combination of the two depending on the circumstances and, and clearly that will play into no doubt some of the discussions that, that may need to be had. Thank you. Can, uh, has that answered your question Councillor Maybury? Um, it has but unfortunately it's led to several more questions. Well, um, can we part, move on to um, another councillor first? Please? Yes absolutely thank, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hinton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, just to come back on that, what I just would remind the Chief Executive when it comes to joint workforces, that uh, the workforce might be joint, but we're two completely separate constitutional and financial bodies. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, Arthur, if you'd like to answer that and then... Um... Yeah, I, I was going to give a brief answer um, and, and only a brief answer and, and, and equally say clearly we're moving well away from the from the budget yeah, debate, exactly. um, which is which I think the chairman was about to say herself. But just to give a brief, brief answer, yes, absolutely. Officers, including myself, are fully aware of the sovereignty. That's why we go through two lots of meetings uh, such as this, uh, having having uh, had the full council yeah. for uh, and budget debate for Mid-Suffolk last week. So we are consciously aware every Every single day of the fact that we serve two sovereign authorities uh, but I would repeat the fact that the staff work for both uh, and unless you want them to sit in two places uh, and even in no circumstances they can't be in two places at once uh, and so I would suggest to all councillors that it would not be logical to go back to a situation where you have two separate council buildings in different places uh, because it would incur additional costs uh, but also provide no additional benefit to your residents. Thank you. So while this has been most interesting and um, and helpful, we are. Can I remind everyone that we are just here to, this evening to discuss the budget. Um, so has anyone got any more questions regarding the budget papers, please? If there are no more questions on the budget papers, we can now move on to debate. Would anyone like to open debate on the budget, please?
if no one wishes to open up question, uh, open up the debate, we could move straight to the vote. Councillor Ward, is, oh, Councillor Arthur, would you like to? Um, I, I reserved my right. Yes, to, you um, did indeed. Speak at the end, if, if we really haven't got anybody else. Not at the uh, moment. OK, um, well, the, the comments I wanted to make really are um, around Councillor Jameson's proposed amendments um, and much of, of what he um, had to say there, as I said at the time, I, I didn't disagree with. Um, so I just wanted to reassure him that we will be monitoring the enforcement team performance. Um, he may not know, but the team is now back up to full strength. Um, as of as of this week, um, they were one down um, up until the end of last week. Um, we will be looking at additional planning training. Um, I can um, reassure him of that. Um, from my point of view, although it's not my portfolio, um, I do agree that we may well have a, a need um, building up for an additional tree officer, um, and we'll be looking at resourcing that. And um, lastly, I absolutely support his ambition for the rollout of EV chargers. Um, he's the district councillor for Lindsay um, and Lindsay Parish Council meet in the village hall um, and he's attended meetings there and I think um, was a great supporter of the fact that we were um, one of the first, um, I think the first village hall in, in Baber to um, install EV charger points. Um, so, yes, the, the rollout of EV chargers in our car parks and our community buildings um, supported via the SIL framework that, as I'm sure he knows, allows 100% funding of green infrastructure, um, only 75% of non-green infrastructure, if you like. So we make a special concession for green infrastructure, which applies to the installation of EV charger points. And I join with him in hoping that we quickly manage to increase the numbers across the district. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Councillor Arthur. Um, Councillor Barrett, did you want to say something to add to some debate? Um, yes, I, I was going to. As, as we're having problems um, starting a end <laughs> yes. date at yes. school, um, I was just going to say that um, um, I, I I think it's a shame that I, we're not going to be able to separate out um, an issue like the parking charge from the general fund budget. Um, uh, I, I voiced my concerns many times about imposing these parking charges at the time of the when we're undergoing the effects of a pandemic um, on the economy and on the health of the nation. But I've got little choice but to because because I can't separate those two issues out. So um, I, you know, I'm I'm happy to um, uh, endorse the, the 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 general budget, and I'll be voting for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. If there's nothing else that anyone else would wish to add, um, I'll ask Councillor Ward if there's anything else he'd like to say. Council Ward. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to get my cameras back on. Good. Um, just just a, a few words. Um, uh, I'd like to endorse everything Councillor Arthur has just said about um, uh, that what we're doing um, on on the green infrastructures uh, funded by SIL, which um, I think is going to have a significant um, benefit uh, to our communities. But um, in conclusion, this hasn't been an easy budget, but we have taken difficult decisions in the best interests of the district. Consequently, we are in a reasonable financial position this year with a healthy level of reserves, and we have been helped by the funding we have received from the government to mitigate the impact of COVID. But as I've said, the medium term challenge is still significant as we strive to become self-financing through maximising our income streams, supported by efficiency improvements, productivity savings and new ways of working. Finally, it was gratifying to see a couple of weeks ago that the local government finance settlement, which was generally seen to be a good one, passed through Parliament without opposition. I hope that this spirit of pulling together during the current pandemic is replicated here this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ward. So we're about to move to the vote um, on this paper. I'll just remind members of the recommendations. So 3.1 is that the general fund budget proposals 
for 2021-22 and four-year outlook set out in the report be approved. 3.2, that the general fund budget for 2021-22 is based on an increase to council tax of £5 per annum, 10p per week, for band D property, which is the equivalent of 2.96%. 3.3, that the flexible use of capital receipt strategy at Appendix E be approved. 3.4, subject to approval by Council, notify the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government of the adoption of the strategy. I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the recorded vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, can you open the vote in the modern dots gov screen by clicking on the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting? The voting for this agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote and councillors, you may need to tab down the page to find the blue line. Thank you. Uh, Janet, it's Councillor Dawson. I'm afraid mine's still stuck. It won't move. OK, Councillor, would you like to um, uh, indicate how you would like to vote, please? Yes, four. Thank you. Councillor Hinton, are you um, able to vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, the voting is 23 for, eight against, and one abstention. Thank you. So uh, the vote is carried. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry to intervene. Can, yes. I make, can I make a point of order, please? Yes. Um, my understanding has always been that a budget vote is a recorded vote. Yes, it is. Um, I just wanted to know uh, where will this be recorded um, so that members and the public may see how everybody voted on the budget? It will be recorded in two places. It will be recorded in the minutes um, and it will be recorded on the council's website. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, now, we've reached the point in the meeting where we need to um, discuss as, as members about the guillotine. Um, so can, if everyone is happy, um, I was planning to have a, an adjournment of the meeting now uh, for five, five minutes or ten minutes, five minutes, and um, if, all, if everyone agrees, we will then continue the business after the five minute adjournment. Is everyone happy to carry on with the meeting to finish the business? If yep. you're not happy, can you tell me now, please? Fine. In that case, we'll take a five minute break and we'll come back at um, quarter past eight and um, we'll continue with the business at 8.15. Thank you, members.
welcome back to the meeting members. We'll now continue with the agenda. Item nine, BC 2025, housing revenue account, 2021 to 22 budget and four year outlook. I would like to invite Councillor Ward to introduce paper BC 2025 and to move the recommendations in the report. Again, I'm minded to allow Councillor Ward and Councillor Jameson, the proposer of the amendment and the seconders, longer than the time normally allowed in these circumstances. All other councillors will have three minutes. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, you'd be pleased to know I, I won't need um, anywhere near the same amount of time as I took for the general fund. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce report BC 2025 for the 2021 to 22 HRA budget and four year outlook. It covers both the revenue account and capital program. I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that this is going to be much shorter, as I said. Um, we have a sound 30 year business plan which will support our ambitions to increase our housing stock and which continues to deliver favourable positions for both revenue and capital. We've been helped by the ending of the annual 1% rent reduction imposed by the Welfare Reform and Work Act 2016. The Act now allows rents to be increased by CPI plus 1% for five years from 2020 to 21. The remaining 25 years of the business plan are based on an annual rent increase of CPI only. The business plan is attached to Appendix B and shows detail for years 1 to 10. The new business plan will be presented to Cabinet and Council during this year. As explained in paragraph 4.2, the plan will include the need to invest in the existing housing stock for environmental improvements and safety enhancements, and to build new homes that meet the draft design guide and an improved new build specification. We are continuing with our aspiration to increase our housing stock. New homes of all types provide us with new homes bonus and council tax, but additional council housing also delivers rental income and wider financial and social benefits. COVID-19 has had a major impact this year. Construction was halted for a period and property repairs and maintenance were reduced for, to emergency repairs only. However, void work in order to support the accommodation of the homeless and rough sleepers continued. And the renovation of the Lees in a matter of days was an excellent, excellent example of what we were still able to achieve. Be very low John, as John, any outstanding um, rental. I think you're you um froze there. Could you please okay. turn your camera off? Thank uh, you. Just could I've you just, just it go off. back a sentence? I think um, it might have frozen for all all members. Levels so, of debt to be written off are expected to be very low, as any outstanding rents are likely to be reclaimed but over a longer period of time because of the commitment the council made not to evict any tenants in which rent arrears could be contributed to COVID. Therefore, there is no adjustment to rental income collection and any impact will be recovered by the strategic priorities reserve with recovery continuing in future years. A small amount of direct COVID related costs has been incurred, £47,000 for PPE, but this has been covered from our general, uh, from our government COVID support. There has been no specific support for the, for the HRA from government yet. The details of the budget are presented in section five of the report, with table one in paragraph 5.2, summarising the key elements and the movements from the 2020 to 21 budget. A surplus position of £127,000 is forecast, which is a reduction on last year's figure of £334,000. We are proposing to transfer the surplus to the strategic priorities reserve. The budget has been based on a number of assumptions. The income ones that affect our tenants being a 1.5% rent increase, which represents an increase of £1.35 on the average weekly rental of £91.70. Garage rents will be unchanged. There will be an increase of 69 pence per week for sheltered housing charges and utility charges will be unchanged. Other movements are explained in paragraph 5.5. The largest contribution to the reduced surplus is the inclusion of £967,000 for depreciation, resulting from a revaluation of the housing stock. However, loan repayments were reduced by £350,000 due to one of our uh, Public Works Loan Board loans being repaid in full by June. Also highlighted here are the key achievements this year, the most notable being that voids remain at an average of 18 days, and an excellent effort by building services has, has resulted in the work in progress reducing from 7,500 to 1,500 outstanding jobs. 
I'm also pleased that we now have that we now have an operational hub for building services at the Great Wenham Depot. Paragraphs 5.6 to 5.9 of the report show the predicted movement in the reserves. The ambitious capital program will, will require funding of £2.617 million from the strategic priorities reserve, as well as additional borrowing. The result will be a reduction in the overall reserves balance to a still healthy £12.167 million. Table 6 in section 5.10 of the report summarises the capital expenditure and financing for the next four years up to 2024 to 25, and Appendix A provides more detail. The differences between the two sets of figures is explained by the current year carry forwards being included in the appendix. New bills and acquisitions are forecast to be £24 million over this period, including a carry forward from the current year. We have worked successfully with ICENI to identify sites and are now proposing an additional 161 affordable and 44 shared ownership homes in the period uh, 2021 to 24. And finally, I'd like to note that right to buy sales have again shown a further reduction and are lower than those projected in the business plan. In 2019 to 20, Baba sold 11 against an original projection of 20 sales. We have been delayed by COVID in our ability to use the right to buy receipts before deadlines for returning unspent portions to government. However, the government has extended the deadline to 31st of March in recognition of this. We have looked at all opportunities to acquire houses or land before this deadline, and I am pleased to report that we will have spent it all and more by the deadline, and so we won't have to return any to government. So I'd like to propose the recommendations in paragraph 3.1 to 3.7 and ask for a seconder. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Jan Osborne. Thank, Thank you, Madam me. Chairman. Yes, I, I would like to second this and I would like to speak. I don't know if I speak now or do I speak after the amendment? You you can do either. You may speak now. I'd like to wish. speak now then, if I may. Yeah, yeah. you may. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to thank my fellow Cabinet Member for Finance for his introduction to the HRA budget for the year 21-22. As the Cabinet Member for Housing, I am fortunate to see firsthand the work of the Housing Service each day. Only last week, I read a letter from a former rough sleeper that had nothing and no one, who is now living in settled accommodation and wanted to express his thanks and appreciation to all those staff from this council that have helped him achieve this. The income the HRA receives is invaluable in supporting our tenants by ensuring their homes are safe, and decent and places tenants are proud to call home. The work of our team supports tenants to not only manage and maintain their tenancies, but support them to succeed and thrive. This year, as with many council services, the impact of the COVID pandemic has impacted on the housing service. However, officers have continued to provide exceptional services, adjusting to working in new ways and finding opportunities to maintain service delivery and develop new ways of working, which have made services even more efficient as set out in this report. This report demonstrates our investment in a further 194 new homes planned over the next three years, along with capital improvements to our existing homes over the short term. These capital works support our tenants' homes being decent, safe, warm, secure, and inviting in strong and healthy communities. An example of this investment includes additional fire detection and fire safety, asbestos removal, and improvements to homes. Our HR business plan to be presented later this year will provide insight into our medium and long term investments in our homes, taking into account our responsibility and duty in relation to fire and building safety, ensuring homes are decent as well as being affordable and economical to run, provide a high level of energy comfort and ensuring how homes meet legislation already set, for example, the government's aim that all social housing will be EPCC or above by 2030. This budget and our continued effective management of the housing revenue account makes us well placed to meet all of our aims and aspirations. As portfolio holder for housing, I would like to take the opportunity to second this report and the recommendations set out with it in paragraph three. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Now, we do have um, an amendment to this paper. Um, members, if you'd like to look at page 105 of your papers, that's where you'll find the amendment. I would like, now like to invite Councillor Jameson to propose the amendment from the Green Group. Councillor Jameson. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We've set out this amendment to help us to ensure that our residents have healthy, secure and warm housing and to help us meet the commitment made to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Many council residents on low income who are living in poorly insulated homes with old or inefficient heat systems are experiencing fuel poverty or are close to it. The latest figures, although three years old, show that the proportion of UK households in fuel poverty is 10%. In 2017, figures showed the average for Suffolk was also 10% and Babel was even worse at 12% or 113 houses. After the effects of last year, this could be worse. The UK housing stock emits on average four tonnes of CO2 a year, which is a significant contribution to the overall emissions the country produces. In 2019, it was reported that homes, that homes contribute to 15% of the total UK emissions. In Proposal 2.2 of the Council's Carbon Reduction Plan, we are committed to seek the resources to assess the environmental performance of our housing stock. And in Proposal 2.3, we state that we will implement a programme of upgrades to heating systems in Council stock, replacing oil systems wherever possible and prioritising heat pumps where appropriate. It's been confirmed to us that, the, as um, Councillor Osborne just said, Officers are developing a housing revenue account business plan, which will be set out our ambitions and financial commitments in the medium and long term. In fact, the council was committed to undertake a lot of work over the next 18 months and has secured green homes funding that will allow us to improve installation, insulation and install air source heat pumps into 38 homes. Further funding is expected to extend this to another 100 homes. This is all good and it's pleasing to learn that so much work is underway. However, we are developing a strategy, as mentioned earlier, that is based on around improving EPC ratings of properties as proposed by the government. However, EPC ratings are not necessarily the answer for improving energy efficiency, as a passive house can have a worse EPC rating than a house with gas heating, but produces a third of the emissions, uh, energy emissions of gas, of the gas, sorry, of the gas heated house. Now, firstly, if we are developing a strategy, we need to ensure it is the correct strategy to meet our carbon commitments. It is possible to make houses zero carbon, but at a cost, the cost is not small. The costs have recently been averaged at £20,000 per house, a total cost of £70 million to this council. Clearly, we will need to borrow and bid for any money we can in the years ahead to raise this kind of sum. But we need to make a serious start now in the coming financial year. If we as a council don't show our commitment, why would a donor body award us a grant? To help the housing team make progress in retrofitting our housing stock, we propose that £2 million be made available from the £12 million housing revenue reserves. This money can be used in the first place to ensure we are following the correct strategy and to help speed up the process the council is already undertaking of identifying the hardest to heat homes against it, amongst its stock. Once we have done that, we can then prioritise houses that will give us the biggest carbon, biggest saving in carbon emissions and heating bills for the lowest outlay. At £20,000 a house, this money can allow us to fully retrofit 100 properties, a small percentage of our total stock admittedly, but used wisely, this could reduce the carbon emissions of many more, I am sure. To reduce fuel poverty and to meet the commitment of carbon zero by 2030, we need a massive reduction in carbon emissions from our homes. To do this in one go, go is not feasible without a huge loan. We can, however, as they say, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Can I have a seconder, please? Yes. Uh, yes, oh, Madam Chair. This? Oh, is that Councillor Lindsay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lindsay. Did you want to speak now or did you want to wait? Um, could I wait, please? Yes, certainly. Um, Councillor Ward, do you accept the amendment? Uh, no, Chair, I don't. And uh, I think uh, Councillor Osborne will um, uh, have something to say and explain why in a bit. Thank you. OK, thank you. So in that case, we will move to debate on the amendment. Councillors will only be allowed to speak once for three minutes, and this will be timed. So we'll now move to uh, debating the amendment. OK, uh, Councillor Mabry, were you wishing to start the debate? 
Yes, I, I will, and thank and thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I will declare that I am the owner of a an air source heat pump. So I deliberately made a choice that I would not be using fossil fuels. Um, if the uh, if the monitoring officer would like to say now if I can continue speaking or whether that's classed as a pecuniary interest, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm happy to confirm that that's not a pecuniary interest. So you are at liberty to continue, Councillor Maybury. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I absolutely agree that this is the way to go. If we are trying to reduce our fossil fuels, our carbon emissions, then um, heat source pumps, whether they are air or ground, are obviously the, the way to go. But coupled with that, we do actually need very good insulation, very high grade insulation. And I am reminded of a development that I visited in Devon, which was built on the very edge of a um, an estate that was bordering onto um, one of the moors. And these were very highly insulated properties and they did not use fossil fuels. They are absolutely amazing. I have shared these photographs many times with um, planning officials. They are just the most amazing properties. And I think that we, apart from retrofitting, we need to move forward with all our housing, with very high insulation, better heating systems, which do not involve fossil fuels. I am trying to um, persuade the developers at Chiltern Woods that this is the way to go. Um, they are resisting at the moment, but I am determined that I will get to the end of fossil fuels, especially on new developments. But we do need to retrofit as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mabry. Councillor Jan Osborne. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, um, as I say again, I'm keeping my video off because I do have got some IT problems. Um, currently, work is taking place by officers to do develop a revised housing revenue account business plan, which will set out our ambitions and our financial commitments in the medium and long term. We expect to bring this work forward during the summer and we will ensure the development of our plans involve all members through meaningful involvement, consultation and including a workshop. We know a recent sur housing survey has put the cost of decarbonisation at £20,742 per property, whilst the figures provided by the social housing sector range from £3,000 to £50,000 per home. For us, the cost could be up to £70 million, whilst we know that the cost of retrofit in the social housing sector is estimated nationally at £104 billion. It is for these reasons that I do not see any benefit to creating a specific reserve for our HRA housing stock in relation to retrofit and sustainability especially when the required investment is so significant in addition to the whole landlord service and all the initiatives we wish to undertake to improve our services for tenants. As I set out at a recent cabinet meeting in response to a question, our work on the development of our business plans requires a transformational approach which utilises our ring-fenced income and ensures that we can provide our existing tenants with high quality, safe accommodation that provides tenants with benefits such as affordable energy bills while supporting our wider environmental aims. This inevitably will involve looking at invest to save initiatives in order to free up monies to enable us to meet the huge challenge in making our existing housing stock carbon neutral. As demonstrated, we need to maximise our HRA receipts to support the improvements to our existing stock while supporting our ambitions to build much needed new affordable homes for our residents. This is why we are committing £21.5 million during the next four years to our capital programme for housing maintenance and renewal and a further £16.2 million to new build and acquisitions during the same period. In addition, in recent months, we have been successful in attracting Green Homes Grant mounting to 618,000 to support external wall insulation and other fabric first improvements to tenants' homes. 
This will provide this authority with adequate provision for pilot schemes for which learning and practical skills required for rollout of more retrofit fabric first schemes will be available. More funding will be required in future years as momentum increases to our CO2 emissions reduction targets by increasing the number of projects and improved homes. I note the Green Party amendment talks of this reserve being used to assist the housing team to identify the best properties area and approach for retrofit and sustainability work. However, I am aware the team is already actively talking to providers that can provide an energy assessment database of our housing stock with intelligence on 85 separate fields relating to building fabric, energy efficiency, renewables and deprivation. In next year's budget, we have initially allocated our capital programme to a total of nearly £3.5 million being spent on homes that could be associated to improving the long term energy efficiency and the environment. This, members, clearly demonstrates our commitment to our homes and the environment. Hence, creating an additional retrofit reserve is not the solution and a broad, broader review of how our HRA assets and limited resources meet all our aspirations will be set out and put forward in the HRA business plan later this year. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Councillor McCraw. Thank you, Chair. Um, I came here a few years ago quite prepared to speak truth to power and also to speak truth to those who would like to be in power. And it's a difficult area. Anybody who's spent as much time as I have on scrutiny and in audit and attending Cabinet can only have the utmost respect for our finance team led by our, our Chief Financial Officer, Catherine Steele. They presented a balanced budget where we didn't think it was possible and the same applies to the housing revenue account. So I asked myself the question, if that team had thought it was fiscally sensible to borrow a further two million, because this eventually will involve borrowing, uh, everything does. Uh, an ill-defined proposal unsupported by evidence, uh, 100 properties at 20,000 per home. This is only for an assessment, however, according to the um, actual proposal. Um, so spending two million just on assessing things, which we should be doing anyway, frankly, and I believe from what Councillor Osborne has just said we are doing anyway, seems to me merely, um, I don't mean to be rude, but it's a little bit postury. Um, if we're going to posture, Let's posture with some sense behind it. There is a debate to be had on this assessment process. It's going to cost a lot more than two million pounds of additional borrowing or any spending. Um, and I'm very much aware of uh, the, uh, our future repayment costs over the next 10 to 15 years, because audit have been looking at that consistently throughout. So I won't be supporting this motion and I'd suggest it's probably not a good one to do. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McCraw. Uh, Councillor Mabry, I'm afraid you can't speak because you've already spoken once in this debate. Was there anyone else who wanted to um, speak in this debate? So in that case, I'll go to Councillor Jameson, who is the proposer of this amendment. Uh, Councillor Jameson, is Sorry, there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, yes, Councillor Lindsay, you reserved your. <laughs> Forgot your time me again. To speak. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Please, please proceed. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, yes, again, um, interesting the um, patronising tone of some of the comments, particularly by Councillor McCraw, I find quite offensive, actually. Um, the amount of work that we put into this. Um, and the assumption that there's no research. Um, uh, I'd be interested to know what, you know, people like Council McCraw did to push for um, a carbon zero homes or better insulated homes since we passed the we passed the um, climate change uh, motion declaration of, of a climate emergency, get to carbon zero. In back in July 2019. So that's more than a year that's passed. And 
as far as housing is concerned, it seems to have been wasted. Now, I appreciate there's some things that the team are struggling desperately to try and do an audit of how many of what houses we have and what our own housing stock of how much energy they're leaking because we actually don't know we don't have the epc ratings on half our council houses so far we desperately need to accelerate that process and we need to give the money to our officers to enable them to do that we of course we need a reserve to do that we need to put aside the money so that we could assure that that gets done our officers need it uh, and um you know th th this is the, the, to say, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money, therefore there's no need to have a reserve, simply doesn't make sense to me. If it's going to cost a lot of money, we need to do it. So we need to start planning for where we get the money. Um, uh, and at this rate, we're still waiting for a business plan. So, so effectively, nothing that makes sense is going into this year's budget. Nothing that we know strategically will be the best way to reduce carbon. As as um, as Lee has pointed out, Councillor Jameson has pointed out, we don't know that we've got the right strategy at the moment um, because e we're going on EPC ratings. EPC ratings aren't are probably not the best way to tell um, whether a house needs insulating more or not. Um, so we, we need to make sure we've got the right strategy. We need to do it quickly. Um, and we appear not to have done that. In the 19, in the 18 months, whatever it is, since we passed the climate emergency. So again, I'd ask uh, people, those people, members uh, in this virtual chamber, who are going to vote against this. Are you absolutely sure that that the housing department is doing everything it can, is prioritising retrofitting its council stock and getting to zero carbon? Because if not, you should support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lindsay. Um, so now um, I'll return to Councillor Jameson, uh, the proposal of this amendment. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, no, nothing more to add at this moment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. Councillor Ward, is there anything you'd like to add? No, um, uh, I think everything's been said uh, on this uh, this evening. Thanks, Chair. OK, in that case, we'll move to the vote um, on the amendment. I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the recorded vote on the amendment, Housing and Climate Change, which is on page 105 in ModGov. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, could you please open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting. In the voting tab, the vote for this agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote. Thank you. Chair, just to say that Councillor Holt has left the meeting, so the voting is 22 against the amendment and nine for the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. So the amendment is lost, in which case we'll now return to the original motion for questions and debate. So we'll start with questions. Uh, we'll move to questions on the substantive motion. Councillors may ask as many questions as they wish However, they must be relevant to the subject under discussion and must be a question. Councillor Hinton, have you got a question? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes. Uh, concerning garages, I noticed that we've actually proposing in this uh, budget that there is no increase in garage charges. Do we know one how many 
of our garages are actually used to put a car into uh, and what sort of impact increasing garage charges might have because we're putting up the cost of accommodation but we're not putting up the cost of putting somebody's uh, quite often junk in a in a container outside. Thank you. Is that Councillor Osborne for this? It is Madam Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Hinton. Um, yeah, there is a pro there is an ongoing project to look at um, all the garage sites to see if there's any possibility for developing them and building houses on them. Um, it's a little bit difficult because obviously some of them are mixed use. And you're absolutely right. There are very few garages that are actually used for storing one's car. Um, if we were to increase the rent, the take up of garages is, is very, very small. So it would be pointless to increase the rent on the garages because then you'd even reduce the take up even less. But there is, as I say, there is a project going on for looking at garages to see how we can maximise the use of the existing garages that we've got or not take up the potential for the site in, repl in to replace the garages that are there. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. Councillor Dawson, have you got a question? Well, actually, no, I was just going to respond to Councillor Hinton, actually. Do I have to ask the question or it's, can I respond? Is, yes, no, you can do that later. Okay. Well, this is our, the time for questions, thank okay. you. You can come back in the debate, Councillor Dawson, for the, with that. Are there any more questions at this stage? Well, if there are no more questions, um, in that case, Councillor Dawson, do, do um, you, can you can open up the debate. Do, do, well, you just coming back to Councillor Hinton to say that actually one of the unfortunate things is, I mean, certainly in Hadley, we have, you know, there's a huge waiting list, my understanding is, to, to, to many years to get a garage. But unfortunately, they're all oh. made, because they're so old, they're made for smaller cars. And so um, Jan's probably quite right. We can't put the prices up because, you know, most people are using them for storage. And I've always suggested, really, we should be compulsory purchasing these garages years ago and developing them. Um, but apparently we can't find the owners. But I mean, that uh, is something I think they should be developed. Thank you. Councillor Dawson, you've actually um, Thank you. Councillor Dawson, you've actually shared um, screen, done a Share, you unshare your screen, please. Could you unshare your screen? That's it. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so did 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 anyone want to respond to Councillor Dawson's um, comments there? Fine. No, but Councillor Dawson is on my screen, Chair. Councillor Maybury, did you want to join the debate? Yes, thank you. I, I think Councillor Dawson has um, a very, very valid comments there. Um, I'm absolutely amazed that um, the council does not see fit to raise the prices substantially on garages because then perhaps they may be given up and then in that respect, the areas would become available for redevelopment. It is true, the bigger cars do not fit in the garages that were possibly built decades ago. And it is also true that they're probably full of um, treasured belongings. Um, and I can attest to that. I think I still have some of my children's belongings that is stored um, around about my property um, but then that's probably my fault because I haven't asked them to take the, to take it all away so I would suggest that the council should be minded to increase the uh, the fees on garages substantially because then obviously uh, they would become available thank you thank you councillor Maybury councillor Osborne did you want to respond I do. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be unfair to um, for those tenants that do actually use their garage to house their car or just generally for storage, bearing in mind a lot of our houses perhaps don't have sufficient storage in them. I don't think they'd be very happy if they knew we were increasing the rent considerably on their garage 
to accommodate our need to um, get people to give up their garages. I don't think that would be a very good idea. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Owen. Thank you. I'll, I'll get on to this debate as well. I don't know if we should be doing these for houses, um, especially up where I'm councillor. You need a lot more car parking spaces. So if they're going to get rid of the garages, they need to um, make the spaces for the cars, what we've already got. So um, especially at my, my area. So I don't know about building houses. I think we should be doing more spaces, making the garages better. Thank you. Councillor Beer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. That was very quick. Um, I wasn't going to comment, but uh, once you got onto car parking and garages. <laughs> Your favourite uh, subject. <laughs> well, what of bungalows. <laughs> uh, um, but no, I, 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 I'm not sure charging more for the garages would actually achieve uh, anything. But I, I am in favour of us looking at to see how we can perhaps um, accommodate those people that have bought their garages in a block where some of them are still owned by the local authority and some are privately owned, uh, and to see whether we could demolish the whole block with their consent, rebuild them if they still want a garage, a, a larger garage, and the spaces that we achieve from the knockdown council garages that are not wanted, that we make them more parking spaces for people to park their cars on the estates with um, EV electric charging points. Um, I don't know whether the uh, cabinet member can comment on that, because I think this is a way forward. Uh, costly, yes, but if, if we started um, sooner rather than later, we could eventually accommodate this over a period of time, because we do need to do something about the verges, about the parking spaces around our uh, council estates. Um, I mean, we have enough problems on the private estates, but we can at least start to try and solve some of them on the um, council estates. Thank you. Councillor Osborne, would you like to respond on this? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, as I stated before, there is a, an ongoing project that is looking at Garrard's sites in its entirety. Um, I think, yeah, Councillor Beer is absolutely right. We do have a real parking problem um, in our town centres and in our rural areas as well come to that, which does need to be looked at. And that part of that will be looked at as the um, evolving parking strategy that will be looking at those issues as well. So we'll be looking to see how that can be addressed, Councillor Beer. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mabry, I'm afraid you've already um, spoken once in this debate and you're only allowed your one go. Is there anyone else who'd like to um, take part in this debate? So if, um, if no one else has anything else they'd like to add, Councillor Ward, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, not really. Uh, um, just to say that um, it, it's uh, a good uh, housing revenue account budget and uh, I do commend it to, to Council um, and I fully endorse what Councillor Beer has said about uh, reducing the number of garages so, uh, to those who just want them and then freeing up the space for open parking because um, he's quite right in, in many of our uh, places we do need to increase the parking provision for residents on uh, on our um, where, where we own the houses. So um, uh, thank you for that, Chair, and uh, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Ward. So we'll move to the vote in a moment. I will just read out the recommendations. So the recommendations are 3.1, that the HRA budget proposals for 2021 to 22 and four-year outlook set out in the report be approved. 3.2, that the CPI and plus one increase of 1.5% in council house rents, equivalent to an average rent increase of £1.35 a week, be implemented. 3.3, that garage rents are kept at the same level as 2020-21. 3.4, that sheltered housing service charges be increased by 69 pence per week 
to ensure recovery of the actual cost of service. 3.5, that sheltered housing utility charges are kept at the same level as 2020-21. 3.6, that the budgeted surplus of 127,000 be transferred to the Strategic Priorities Reserve in 2021-22. 3.7, that in principle, right to buy receipt should be retained to enable continued development and acquisition of new council dwellings. I will now ask the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Service to conduct the recorded vote. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, could you please open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting. In the voting tab, the vote for this agenda item will show in blue. Please click on the blue line to open the vote and you will need to tab down on this vote. Thank you. Chair, the voting is 24 for the recommendations and seven against. Thank you. So that vote is carried. Thank you. So we'll now move on to item 10, recommendations and reports from cabinet or committees. 10A, BC 2026, Joint Capital Investment and Treasury Management Strategies 2021-22. I would like to invite Councillor Huron to introduce paper BC 2026 and move the recommendations in the report. Councillor Huron. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. This is the most exciting paper tonight, BC 2026. I'll try and keep my intro um, down a little bearing um, with respect to the time. This report is the capital investment and treasury management strategies for 2021. There have been no significant changes in format this year, and it's been updated to reflect the latest capital expenditure, investment and borrowing, and the latest Treasury management investment and borrowing positions of the Council. Under the SIP for Treasury Management Code of Practice and the Prudential Code, both published in 2017, and MHCLG Investment Guidance published in 2018, we are required to determine separate capital investment and strategy statements and prudential indicators annually before the start of each financial year. I'll just run through the appendices. The capital strategy, that's Appendix A. This summarised the capital expenditure and financial requirements of the full capital programme for both the general fund and housing revenue account. The details details of which are in the budget report. It shows that capital expenditure plan for 2021, including carry forwards, is 41.4 million, of which 16.4 million will be funded by borrowing. Appendices B, the investment strategy. This details those expenditure items in the capital programme that specifically relate to assets bought and or owned by the councils purely or partially to generate a return. This includes schemes which have the purpose of regeneration or development of the local area, as well as generating a return. In the context of this strategy, investments mean those non-treasury management activities. Appendix C, uh, Treasury Management Strategy 2021, this sets out the Council's borrowing requirement and borrowing and treasury management investment strategies. This also includes the list of approved investment counterparties and their limits. There has been no significant change to limits since last year. 
Appendix D, that's the Treasury management indicators, which we use to measure and manage the Council's exposure to Treasury management risks. Appendix E, economic update and interest rate forecast. The combined effect of Brexit and the after effects of the pandemic will dampen growth relative to peers, maintain spare capacity and limit, limit domestically generated inflation. The Bank of England are therefore expected to maintain loose monetary conditions for the foreseeable future. Appendix F chairman co covers the current investments and debt portfolio and it shows the position at 30th of November last year. Labour borrowing at the moment totals 107 million, of which 95 and a half million is public works loan board and 11.5 is short term borrowing. On the investment side, Baber has 15.6 invested. Uh, this includes CCLA, UBS, Schroders, Investec and the funding circle. We have continued the policy of withdrawing funds from the funding circle as loans drop out and we have not invested any more new money. Appendix G, Treasury Management Policy Statement, underpins the strategy and sets out the Council's regard to the monitoring of risk and performance. And the primary objectives remain security of capital, then liquid liquidity, followed by return and there has been no, no change from last year. Appendix H is the minimum revenue provision statement. Appendix I, the institutions meeting higher credit rating criteria and ends with a glossary of terms, which I'm fast trying to get used to as um, quickly as ever I can. Um, I'm happy to pro propose paper BC 2026 and look for a seconder. I would like to thank the whole team who are absolutely brilliant. Um, I think Catherine Steele is here to answer any questions and we've been joined recently by Rebecca Hewitt, who I think is also on hand. She's um, a recently joined member only a few months ago, but a uh, valuable asset and a very sharp cookie. So I'm sure she will answer questions as well. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry it's so late, but um, we will answer questions between us, um, I am sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Horan. Could I have a seconder, please? Is that Councillor McLaren? Would you like to be the seconder? Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm very happy to second uh, this paper. Thank and, you. And just want to add my thanks to the team. They've done a tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now move to questions. Councillors may ask as many questions as they wish. However, they must be relevant to the subject under discussion and must be a question. Would anyone like to open the questions? There do not seem to be any questions. So in that case, we'll move straight on to debate. Um, councillors will only be allowed to speak once for three minutes and this will be timed. Councillor Lindsay, would you like to open the debate? Sorry, I'm a bit late again. I, I just had a, one question, genuine question. That, yes, uh, please ask your question. It, it was, um, uh, we uh, discussed this paper um, at, uh, at the audit committee and um, I'm trying to recall now that we, we, we proposed a sort of amendment to the recommendations. I think that was the recommendations to Cabinet, wasn't it? Not so I shouldn't look for them in this in this paper. Is that right, Councillor Harriner? Uh, are you talking, um, Councillor Lindsay, about moving more towards the green um, agenda and looking at alternatives yeah. to fossil fuels? Yes, in the um, in the in the Treasury's investments, yeah. Uh, that will that will be dealt with at the next meeting. Um, I think you've already been um, reassured of that. A lots of the investments we just can't change. We can't um, get out of easily. And I'm sure Catherine would back me up on that. But it is work ongoing and I am largely with you. We do need to move and it will happen. But 
Um, it's all a bit time limited, especially with investments. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything that they'd like to add? Fine. Um, so, Councillor Horan, is there anything else you would like to add before we go to the vote? No, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think that's it. It's uh, a very worthwhile paper that's the very sort of basis of what we do and um, put together by a very good and secure team. Thank you, Councillor Horan. So in that case, we'll move to the vote. Um, I won't read out all the recommendations. You have them in front of you. Um, so I would like to invite the Corporate Manager, Governance and Civic Office to conduct the electronic vote. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, again, can you please open the vote in the modern.gov app by clicking the plus sign in the top right hand of the agenda screen and selecting attendance and voting. The voting tab for the agenda item will show in blue and please click on the blue line to open the vote. Again, councillors, you will need to tab down. Thank you. Chair, the voting is 26 for, three against and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. So that vote is carried. Thank you. Item 11, councillor appointments. Are there any changes to placings? So I don't think there are any changes to placings. So in that case, if there's nothing, no, there's no further business this evening. It's been a long evening, but thank you very much for your attendance. And um, I look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, the next meeting is Tuesday the 23rd of March and it's at 5.30. So I look forward to seeing you all then and um, have a good rest of the evening. Not much of it left.